So, let me tell you something that you should have already realized by now about this fucking show you're listening to. This shit is supposed to be for mature audiences. As in grown-ups, mentally mature. It's supposed to talk about adult subjects, an adult frame of mind. It's not fucking that at all. This is two emotionally regressed, broken half-whips pretending to offer insight on movies. All they really offer you is an endless sexual perversion and a laundry list of personal paraphilia issues. You can make your own choices in life, but you have to choose this as entertainment. You know you're better than this. You have to know you are better than listening to Cinema Psyops. Fifth consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. For those of you in the know that have been listening long enough, you know that on all the multiples of 25, we do a full franchise fest. And super stoked that we're doing the laziest version of a full franchise fest this week is my co-host, Matt. That's a lot of math. I'm not here for the math. I was told there'd be no math. So. Uh, usually there is no math involved for you. I, I just feel like I've been lied to. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I need to I, I need to talk to some people. <laughs> well, since you're leaving us short-staffed here at Cinema PsyOps by taking the one week of vacation that we do tend to allow, which rec- basically equates to two days worth of actual work during that week. Um, yeah. Since you've decided to leave the rest of us short staffed and trying to find our way around what it is that we're going to do for the following week that you'll be gone. Um, yeah. You can feel as guilty as you want because uh, we're picking up your slack now. 
Yes, yes, I do apologize for the trip I'm about to partake on, but uh, can't be helped. <laughs> that ayahuasca isn't going to do itself. That's goddamn right, man. Listen, I'm trying to have an experience over here, trying to get on a different level. No, I'm just trying to state how most managers like to do their employees where... Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, what what happened? Oh, I'm sorry, boss. Somehow I caught the fucking flu. Do you know how this makes me feel? The fact that you're vomiting everywhere? Pretty bad. You motherfucker. <laughs> no, most of the bosses are like, well, you're you're leaving us in the lurch here. You know, what are we what are we gonna do? Doesn't yeah. matter if you're vomiting out of both orifices of your body. What are we yeah. gonna do? What what, about a, what is my poor planning as a manager that is causing us to be short staffed? What is that gonna do? Now I'm gonna have to call around to a bunch of other people and try to make them come in with a guilt trip saying that we really could use the hand because yeah. of my poor planning in order to try and make the budget look that much better so that I can get that much more of a bonus. Yeah, okay, so just as a word of uh, warning to all managers out there that pull that shit. Fuck you, stop listening to my show. Yeah, fuck and off. I, I mean that, I mean that. Uh, work no, work I or sell the day seriously. I'm, I'm quite with you on that. It's fucking just stupid as shit. You can lie but. to yourself and you can tell yourself that you have to do it that way, but you know goddamn well as a manager you do not. And yeah, uh, you don't. And we're going to publicly shame you for it, you capitalist yeah. pig dog. I'll, I'll tell you the goddamn truth. When I was a teenager and I worked at a grocery store, uh, one day I started not feeling very well. Just, I couldn't, like, I just was not feeling right. So I was like, hey, I need to get the hell out of here. And a manager took me into a very small room, sat almost face to face with me, and berated me for about 30 minutes. Um, and then said, fine, if you still feel like you need to go, I guess go ahead and go. But really laid on a guilt trip real thick. I get out to my car and I vomit all over the park. Lot. Uh, that entire night, I was up every hour on the hour vomiting. Um, a friend of mine who lived with me and my family at the time also caught the flu. And my dad had the flu all in the same night. All three of us just vomiting all night. And I was like, wow. You know, so I finally get back into work after all that's fucking done. And I find out shithead manager just threw up in the bathroom. He's got the flu. Most likely got it from me. So when he was leaving, I go, hey, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure your health's good. What are we supposed to do with lack of management on the floor? <laughs> he uh he didn't think it was as funny as i thought it was <laughs> not at the job that i'm currently at now but the one that i left yeah. when i had a series of increasingly poor and awful managers uh except for the last one so there was a manager that got started that was finally like an actual good boss at this uh -huh. place like an actual decent human being who actually was trying to make it better for everybody and actually was doing his job as a manager and yeah. you know knew that he didn't have to worry about being short-staffed or anything like that that the shit would still get gone, done that kind of thing but that uh -huh. was after I already had gotten my education and was starting to field job offers to leave this place. Well, of course. Yeah, yeah, you gotta do what's best for you. <laughs> right. So that, that guy got screwed and he's like, why you gotta punish me? I'm like, it, it ain't your fault I'm leaving. It's everybody else yeah. before you. Yeah, so uh, again, I if, mean, you're, if you're and, a poor manager, if you are a poor yeah. manager, and well, those of you out there that are management, I'm sure there are some of you that, that you feel like you're good. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure you do. But if you have ever tried to tell someone that wasn't feeling well that they can't leave because you're leaving everybody else in the lurch and short staffed, you're part of the problem and you mm -hmm. need to get the fuck out of my life. Yeah. And, and mine was even worse. It wasn't like, oh, you're leaving a short staff. It was, it's irresponsible to leave work when you're sick. That's what he kept saying to me. And I'm like, hmm, all right, fine. Like you weren't <laughs> trying. Yeah. 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 And like, oh, and it's your responsibility to take care of your health. And I'm like... Yeah, okay, so you're telling me human beings just don't ever, you've never been sick in your life, you fucking jackass. You know, we really don't have a segue in management versus the exterminator, no. other than what we're talking about is workers' rights, and I believe that the main draw or the main cause of what's going on in exterminator was a friend trying to make sure that another friend's family was taken care of whenever he could no longer work, being that yes. that friend was the main breadwinner in the family. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 I'm down with uh, exterminator. I, that, I'm just going to say it. I, I found that extremely interesting because this is by far one of the meanest, grittiest exploitation franchises. Even though it's only two movies, it's still a franchise because Canon did give it a shot. It just didn't work. Yeah. You know, it's not Canon's fault the Exterminator t didn't get picked up like Texas Chainsaw Massacre did when their other sequel they made failed. Mm -hmm. It would still be the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise had it stopped at just those two blessed, wonderful movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> had we never gotten another one, it would still be technically a franchise. And that's it's what we still ha- franchise. Right. And that's what we have here with the Exterminator one and two. But they are vastly different films because Canon Films picked it up for part two. And yeah. the exploitation, sleaze, grittiness, and weirdness of it, and just the let's call it the canonization, like the Canon Films touch that gets put onto the Exterminator series is yeah. directly parallel, I believe, with what they did with Death Wish 2 versus Death Wish. Am I wrong? No, it's 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 pretty well there. Yeah, you're not wrong at all. <laughs> the other thing I want to talk about the series before we really start to dig into these two films is the plethora of that person actors and actresses yeah. in this yeah. film. There's like a handful of that fella and that lady and that mister and that fucking thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> a lot of it. Yeah. And even you get a you get you get at least one crossover between uh what the fuck is that in both films and that is played by Erwin Keyes. It's different characters but it's pretty much the same kind of person and Erwin Keyes yeah. is in both and he's that giant hulking man that's yes, like super the, imposing the he was also in House of a dude. Thousand Corpses yeah yeah. he was the, the helper in House of a Thousand Corpses that uh, or the, the Captain Spaulding giant head thing out front oh yeah that's right yeah, yep, yep, yep. it's Erwin Keys. Now, our our astute listeners will recognize him from like a shit ton of other fucking movies. He was even in the Warriors and shit. And again, the whole the cast in this, there's a whole bunch of this guy, that gal, this lady, and what the fuck is that fucking thing? And in yeah. this case, the what the fuck is that fucking thing is the lack of flamethrowers in this movie. Yes, what? Where are all the th- flamethrowers at? This is an interesting, interesting series because the film is trying to sell that the exterminator takes care of people with a flamethrower. I mean, the cover is a guy holding a flamethrower in a very phallic way with the yeah. flame even curving just up and to the left. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That's uh, these are truth facts. This poster. They, 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 uh, listen, a lot of the weaponry in this is all, all <laughs> about male phallicism at its finest. Uh, all right. The symbolism in this film is essentially this. It is men are men and women should be damn proud of it in the exterminator. Like there is so much testosterone, toxic masculinity bullshit that like I don't even oh, want to yeah. fuck around. I just wanted to get into both the movies. I'm I'm ready if you are. Like yeah. right. And, and really, let me say it: the men are men and the women rightfully should be scared of all men, and we are disgusting people. This movie's <laughs> to be believed. <laughs> Interesting that your brain went there. All right. So this week we are going to have featured in on the pirate radio edit all the music featured in Exterminator 1 and 2. So all the music that we will be featuring this week was also played in Exterminator 1 and or 2. Yeah. And if it's not the pirate radio edit, I will get something as reasonable facsimile to the type of music that I am playing as I possibly can. But what am I going to do? Those bots be scrubbing. Here's that fucking promo. This will keep it quiet. (laughs) Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. Oh, I ain't gonna live like this no more. Most of my life's been waging war till I found peace. I could have swore What she did shook me to the core And I ain't gonna live like that no Oh, I ain't 
ain't gonna live like this no more trouble. All right, so that is Heal It by Roger Bowling is the person that is performing that, who is more known as a uh, music uh, composer for various well-known like hits than actually more of a singing and uh, performing career of his own. But interestingly enough, he performs two of the songs that are in Exterminator, and I don't think either one of them is in this trailer. In war, you have to kill to survive. On the streets of New York, the choice is the same for the exterminator. The search is on. The police are chasing a killer who's not only smarter than they are, he's doing their job. That's what it's like to be a victim. The exterminator. The man they pushed too far. All right, there was a bunch of noise and sound effects and, you know, all of that kind of stuff of things that happen in yeah. the film that you can see, which are great, but not in an audio format. So there you go. Yeah, that, that yeah, that's just not going to work out. All right. The Exterminator, part one. Uh, first 20 minutes start. Uh, we're in the Vietnam War and uh, a couple guys that get captured. Uh, there, One guy's being interrogated. He won't answer. So uh, they cut his friend's head off. And it's pretty gnarly. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to say about this opening sequence uh, for behind the scenes stuff and uh, trivia and all of that kind of thing. Oh. Um, but uh, the wars, the explosions, all of that kind of stuff. This felt like a like you were just getting this over the top action film, and this it yeah. really sets up like you're expecting that you're going to get fucking Rambo, right? Is what they're basically yeah. showing you here. Something, yeah. I'm, I'm expecting like he's going to get free somehow, and right? Like the, go back the op- to the real world, and then something's gonna happen well the opening uh, the opening of the film sets up like a war movie of epic proportions and there is no way that they can keep up what it is that they're trying to do yeah well uh, maybe not so much but it's still uh, i'll get to it in the end um all right that's fine yeah just kind of because it's a total movie thought so i don't want to yeah you know let's do that let's get back to it so the head cutting was definitely amazing and that was a another big portion of the The what we're talking about whether yeah it was a big portion of the budget all right i'm just gonna dump the beans now uh the opening sequence of the film all the stuff that takes place in vietnam was over 20 percent of the movie's two million dollar budget i could see that happening for sure (laughs) they spent four hundred thousand dollars on every one of those gasoline explosions the beheading Mm -hmm. All of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can see that. They also filmed that in the same national park that the sequence that Vic Morrow died in for the Twilight Zone was shot at. With the stuff that was in Vietnam where Vic Morrow got killed, that Uh was uh, the Twilight Zone, the movie uh, that that he died in. It's that same area. Uh, I guess it's called Indian Dunes National Park. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, so they tried to say that it was filmed in Vietnam and all that kind of stuff, and I don't know where all that $400,000 really went, because a lot of those explosions were like just balls of gasoline lit on fire fire yeah possibly um anyway uh right as he's about to get murdered uh another one of his buddies comes up kills almost everybody uh frees him and the guy he frees uh kills the head commander guy in the water cut to new york kind of a long opening sequence of of you know it's a a title sequence pretty long um featuring one of the songs i'm gonna play tonight in that sequence by the way Uh, oh there you go well we see the two guys uh now they work at a warehouse to uh, with one another well they decide uh then uh you know we see the foreman's inside the warehouse and a couple of mobster looking guys come in to collect probably what's the the week's debt you know what you know for protection or whatever whatever they're doing um well the two guys are getting ready to just hang out have a good day and he's like hey let's let's get some coffee later and the guy goes all right well if you buy mine i'll take the i'll take the the shipment in he goes all right so he takes the shipment in and he sees their guy stealing well, he gets held up by knife point uh, by the guys, and uh, then his buddy who saved him before, he shows up and he's like, well, no, I don't fucking think so. And they beat the crap out of the guys. So, you know, there's that. One of the dudes um, in that sequence was Erwin Keyes. He was really, really the big guy there, and he's the one that was like beating oh, yeah. on, uh, on our main hero here of the film like it wasn't a thing until the person who I feel is the true hero of the film and his role gets cut short um, comes and smashes the dude with the uh, giant case 
disappear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our man John, played by Robert Ginty, is getting his ass kicked. And uh, it's Steve James is the actor's name. And we'll talk about him at the 20 minutes a little bit more because uh, there's a uh, lot of those that guys um, that we need to talk about. And one of those that guys is a dude that I have never in my life seen without his tattoos before. And that was the main guy that was Eastland. in charge. of Yeah, that was pulling the knife on everybody. Not Eastland. Oh, not oh, Eastland. That guy. Oh, the, the main bad Eastland, guy. That, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Every time I've ever seen that particular actor, he's like tattooed neck to, you know, toes. <laughs> <laughs> basically <laughs> nice yeah so like i don't it, this obviously was before that in 1980 and it was just really strange to see him so anyway let's keep going huh? all right later on um the guys are gonna grab a beer so um the guy kind of you know he goes to say goodbye to his kids uh because they had probably worked like overnight so they're getting off in the morning and they decide they're gonna go grab beer he says goodbye to his wife that this is the guy who did the saving in vietnam and in this instance he did the saving as well so uh he uh they all go and he's leaving to go grab a beer well he gets jumped by that gang uh they beat the crap out of him and then they take a hook and just impale it into his back uh and that's no good uh then we see what is now going to be the main character eastland talking with the guy's wife telling her that he's probably paralyzed he's got to live on ventilators all that kind of stuff and you know so uh not a, not a good time for anybody involved and uh uh, and and uh, screw that gang. So now you hate somebody. You have somebody to hate. <laughs> That's the end of the first 20 minutes already. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think that actually sets up. It, sh- it makes sense that that would be a plot break, really, that his friend yeah. is uh, then paralyzed uh, when we find that out. I think it's an interesting choice that this film makes where his friend, Michael, is, you know, the one that is clearly the better warrior. And it is just their friendship that has basically been keeping um, John Eastland alive, right? I mean, yeah, pretty much. For the most part. And that's at least what the film has shown us so far is that it's not that Eastland can't handle himself. It's that he has a bit of a temper and he gets in over his head and Jefferson comes and saves his ass, essentially. Yeah. Um, essentially, yeah. You know, I mean, that's kind of what happened in that over huge fucking Vietnam sequence with all of the fire and explosions and just insane craziness. I don't, do we need all seven of the choppers being exploded that we saw? Yes. All the choppers must explode. I don't know why we're talking about this. Why are you? Ha- why do you hate fun? It's not that I hate fun. I just don't understand spending four hundred thousand dollars for five minutes of film. And that's why you hate fun. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm trying to help you here. All right. So I, I didn't think the explosions looked all that great, and um, you could see the seams of everything that they were doing. And I think it cheapens the film, and they spent so much money on it too. And I think it ruins kind of the production value. And uh, uh, I, I'm going to say it right now, Matt. I skip that war sequence anytime I watch this, and I'm not covered. It. You're the worst. I go from the head I, chopping off part. It, well, I I fast forward to that point and then oh, okay, you know, just fast. I I go past all the giant gasoline ball explosions <laughs> that are in it, which is so not like me. But they just look so forced and so cheap, and it just I don't know, man. Like I just I never got into it, and it weirds me out that like you thought it was the coolest thing ever, but of course it's a giant bunch of balls of flame. So of yeah, course I don't know about the coolest thing ever. I'm just saying uh, the, the head chopping off scene was the coolest thing ever for me. Oh yeah, I'm, that I'm, looked. I'm being, I'm being facetious with you about all the other shit. Yeah, no, no, that definitely looks great. And uh, that's definitely something that we want to talk about because that was a good portion of the budget too. And that actually was a very expensive effect. And believe it or not, that was taken out. Um, wow. In the UK, uh, they had to cut um, that that head chopping had to be pretty much completely removed. Uh, the decapitation was removed for like in Finland as well and all of that. And it's really interesting because they spent a lot of money money like trying to get that they had to basically pose the actor uh in such a way as to get and they had to do a full body cast so they had to pose mm-hmm. the actor in the way that he was going to be screaming or wincing or looking away or holding his head or whatever right as the blade was coming to chop so that they could get a good clean edit and make it look like it so he had to have the same facial expression in the mold holding his body the same way and they had to hold, mold all of that to make that effect work which makes sense as to why that would be so expensive yeah well I actually it does right that's kind of all you really need is a flashback sequence of him and his friend getting caught and then escaping the camp like you don't need all of the giant piles of explosions up before that and then the ridiculously huge amounts of explosions after that i just feel like it didn't give them the production value that they were expecting it to maybe why do you hate america <laughs> i hate it for its freedom matt apparently i knew it i fucking knew it oh. i hate 
you hate freedom. Well, here's here's the thing, right? Once they start getting into the streets of New York and we start seeing 1980s New York, which is very empty and very yes. broken down and very fucked up. And the thing that we were talking about when he leaves the apartment right before he gets mugged, he's walking around decaying, collapsing fucking tenement block buildings that just oh, yeah, yeah. Aren't, aren't even there anymore. And he's walking over piles of bricks and he cuts through one of those sections like, you know, he was walking in like an alleyway or whatever and he cuts through like almost like an empty lot or like through a fence that fences off an empty lot between one of these dilapidated fucked up buildings and that's where these guys yeah. nab him you know and they are the yeah. same guys that fought them so clearly they knew he was the beverage guy they knew how to follow him home and they knew that was you know you had to know yeah. that was something like that was going to happen of course the thing that I find interesting about the exterminator for these kind of vigilante taking revenge for the things that have happened, kind of movies that were spun up in the wake of Death Wish. Let's face it, Death Wish was pretty much the one that got everybody going with yeah, these kinds of Yeah, this is definitely a Death Wish type movies. Yeah, heavily right. inspired by. <laughs> the thing I like what they're doing with this is they're taking lifelong friends and they're taking the ruining of a lifelong friend's prospects of his yeah. life. You know, it's not yep. even that they killed him. It's just that they paralyzed him and they took mm -hmm. away all the potential that he was going to have. And it's for a, his wife and young family. Right. And it's it's a much more interesting um, dynamic to storytelling for me than the wife and family, you know, the wife and daughter or the, you know, in Death Wish's case or the wife and family or whoever, you know, or, or like a son is killed or a child is killed. It's these lifelong friends that uh, have this sort of blood debt or life debt, you know, like they kind of have obviously saved each other's lives. You would hope that John is repaid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Jefferson Throughout once or twice. This time. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you would hope so. But I don't I don't think that uh, John has ever really gotten a chance to repay him, which is what drives him. Uh, one thing that Ginty does really well, because he's certainly not intimidating to me, and I have a hard time believing him of capable of doing the kinds of violence that they show him in but what he does really really well is this very stoic very unflinching just almost like he's just not there all he's doing yeah. is observing and just had this like thousand yard stare and when he's with his friend he doesn't have that you know because he's got something that he can anchor to and like he's a normal guy he's laughing he's smiling he's you know and he kind of anchors to his friend's wife and kids that way because they're his friend's family but he can't even relate to them in a way that that's like kind of normal either like yeah. like he's very awkward around them and so the what they're doing is they're taking away like his grounding in the in in the world and so the way that ginty plays it where like he's got nothing left like he's not connected to anything anymore and that sort of dead behind the eyes stare that he has doing all of the stuff that he does that's what makes him intimidating and terrifying to me like yeah i i just don't find what, him physically threatening but when you look him in the eye a man who had already lost everything lose in his mind yeah. All he had, he didn't have a wife and kids. He just had his friend who also happened to save his life in Vietnam. And now he couldn't be bothered to do the same. You know, that's what he's saying in his mind, which makes him dangerous. Yeah. And the fact that he is no longer there, that's the part that I find intimidating because again, yeah. I don't find him physically threatening like at no, all. No, And I think that's supposed to be the whole point. You're not supposed to find him physically threatening, but he learned how to murder in Vietnam. He learned particular skills in being a soldier. So. Right. And it's interesting because he becomes so cold and like, like, I think the term exterminator for what he becomes is actually quite excellent. And it's just, yeah. it's stuff that I wanted to kind of lay out the groundwork in the film, because I'm going to have a lot of things about the film that I'm going to nitpick as far as production wise and the look of it and some of the sequences and some of the stuff that they did. But I just want to point out the script for this, from what we've gotten on screen, the story points that we're getting and the takes that they're doing and the way that they're laying out the story, that is the thing that keeps me coming back to this film. Um, yeah, I really, really like The story is good. And I dig the way that Ginty plays that and I, I am glad that you agree with me there that he's basically a guy that literally has nothing left and he is yeah. not for this world anymore and that makes him more terrifying I'm glad that you saw that too uh, because yeah. that that's kind of how I wanted to frame the rest of my discussion um, and I feel like I don't really need to bring up points you know to try and justify it anymore because you saw it too so I'll just make the comments about what I saw when I saw it um, like a normal review from here on out and we're good to go all right
With everything else kind of all right happening, we start with the next twenty minutes. Uh, Eastland finds one of the gang members and has him tied up. And he, this is our first time seeing a fl- the flamethrower that he will use a lot. Uh, that was um, one of those that guy actors. I couldn't tell what I was recognizing. I don't know him from. that that one wasn't a that guy for me, but uh, uh, you, you might know more on that than me. On uh, that one. He was one of the scumbag lawyers that kept trying to hire Kim away in Better Call Saul. Um, I think he was Rick or whatever, and he ended up working with uh, her for a while. But he said that guy actor, you don't recognize him because this it's the first time he's never had any facial hair at all. He always has some kind of a full face, oh. dark beard. His name is uh, Dennis uh, Baltaskarski Bout- or whatever. I can't pronounce it. I just looked him up to make sure. And yes, he was in Better Call Saul for sure. It is him. Uh, he just has a fucking beard like all the time. I oh, okay. t- Trust me, if you saw him with the beard, you'd be like, oh, it is him. And it took me forever to make sure that I, I actually did recognize him. But that's him. Anyway. All right. Uh, cool. Um, uh, so anyway, he's able to get, uh, the, the location of the gang's hideout because he doesn't really light the guy on fire, but he just makes it seem like, yeah, it's, it's going to happen if you keep going. So don't be a dick. Um, and that is the whole of the flamethrower action in this film. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. This, the, the flamethrower really gets used more in the next film. Uh, <laughs> And we'll talk about that as to why, but uh, they tried to sell it as a guy with a motorcycle helmet and a flamethrower killing people, which is fucking 80s badass, and you can't wait to see it. And all you get is Robert McGinty shooting a fucking flamethrower in the general direction of the other guy, in fact, in a way to intimidate him, thinking he's going to burn him alive if he doesn't give him info, so he does. Yeah, there you go. Kind of a letdown, Uh, because the cover really makes you think you're getting more, but that's on you, (laughs) Court, for looking at that cover and thinking you're getting full flamethrower action. Yeah, how dare you? (laughs) <laughs> well, anyway, uh, he busts in on the uh, three great gang members. They have w- women there, and he gets the women out. He has a huge uh, M16 rifle. Uh, as he's trying to corral them, one guy tries to jump him, and he shoots that guy in midair, killing him. And he knocks out the other two. Um, and as he's doing that, he starts uh, he starts getting some uh, flashbacks after knocking him out. Um, uh, then we cut to the outside of the building. A detective is showing up at this scene, and he, we see he had tied up the other two in an, an abandoned building almost. And the cops show up to that building. Apparently, everyone's vomiting because it's gross. The, the, he just left them there alive and apparently they were eaten alive by the rats so yeah that was the best way to die that was pretty fucking vengeful yeah you said he has half the guy has half a face yeah but uh the guy had basically used the uh n-bomb word when describing steve james's character of jefferson oh yeah i was just gonna skip over all of that right but then robert mcginty's character john says that that was his best friend and that's when he knocks him out and it's important because it's important to talk about because like yes he paralyzed his best friend and sure in certain psychotic uh rationale one could think yeah it makes sense as to why he would feed this human being alive to rats right but i yeah. feel like the thing that made him trigger into that flashback and then made him choose such a harsh punishment was because the person was referring to his friend in such a way as that it kind of triggered this memory and in triggering that memory it's also how he sealed his own fate by using a racial slur against the friend that they paralyzed. That's true. Yeah. So uh, just something to think about. Then we cut to back at the warehouse. We're going as normal. However, Eastland starts to notice these two guys in suit show up at the warehouse for money again. Then we cut to two very business looking men talking. And that's our first clip. That makes it terrible. Whatever happened to Moon Mullins and Maggie and Jiggs and Buck Rogers? You remember Buck Rogers? Nah, you don't remember Buck Rogers. I just spoke to Washington and there. Excuse us, Hunter. We got a little business to talk over. Why don't you finish your breakfast out by the pool? I'll join you in a moment, baby. Sit down. What the hell's the matter with you? You know better than to talk in front of her. The price of beef is going up too fast in New York. They feel a congressional investigation is imminent. So what do they want from me? A four cent drop for the next six months. <laughs> six months, huh? Do you know how much that'll cost me? Hey, you seem like a smart young man. You tell me. What am I paying those guys down there for anyway, huh? Can't they do something about it? They are doing something about it. 
They're giving you a warning that could save us a lot of aggravation. You can't afford to be too greedy. It's not like the old days. All right, all right, all right. Work it out. But don't you give me no crap about the old days. At least in the old days, you could understand the comics. Today, all I got is cosmic ducks and star shit. Now, you get out of here. Don't you come back until you have something I want to hear. Okay, Mr. Pantabini. Whatever you say. Wow. Hmm. Beef. It's what's for dinner. And this yeah. guy, he's he's definitely, this guy's definitely old timer. He's he, he, This guy's mad at the car. I can't even understand the comics anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really interesting, the intimate look at the uh, mafia in such a way as to understand how just a four cent change in what I'm guessing is the yeah. per pound price of beef is going to be highway robbery for him. Like it's too much, mm-hmm. even though he's controlling literally everything about the price, it sounds like. And the only way they're going to keep an investigation from happening and he's being warned from someone that he's also paying off as part of this scheme. Uh, yeah, this film knows a little too much about the inner workings of the mafia, I think. Yeah, it, it kind of seems like it. I uh, I don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just taking pot shots because I didn't like all the gasoline explosions. Uh, Glickenhouse, the director of this film, also made a movie called McBain. Yes, there is actually a movie called McBain, Matt. And yes, There's... I believe that that is the movie that influenced The Simpsons for that movie, McBain. Oh, that's fucking rad. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there is a movie out there that is made by the same director that is so over the top and crazy with its action that it became a running gag on the simpsons oh hopefully it has a guy like with just nothing but (laughs) one-liners i don't know but i know it exists and i know it's out there and now the audience is going to want us to cover it but let's move on Uh, oh probably and i can't even fucking blame them at all so anyway (laughs) because now i want to cover it all the time um all right so uh then eastland visits his friend in the hospital and uh, tells him that he thinks he can, he he found those game members and he took care of them and kind of goes in a little diatribe how it didn't really even feel like nothing they did anything wrong it you know just felt like he did a job like they would do back in the war so th- that's always going to be disconcerting kind of talk coming from a Vietnam vet. Um, yeah, it actually, the way that he performs this and the very matter of fact, nonchalant, very just kind of empty, not like a guy talking with any remorse, but like kind of like a guy talking about how he missed those good old days and kind of is glad yeah. he has an excuse now. Man, did he ever miss murdering people? Yeah. Um, and like the cold, heartless way that he just talks about all of this is what's yeah. so unnerving about his character. This, and then he says, you know, listen, I have possibly a way of making some money now uh, as well, kind of doing all this stuff and then he'll give that money to of course this guy's wife and the guy almost kind of side-eyeing him and i always saw his friends kind of side i'm like don't do this man don't don't become a uh, damn murderer just because you know that's the, always the look i thought his friend was giving him kind of like uh, i don't know if i agree with you doing this uh his uh, friend was giving him the look about murdering them like that at first until he told him that he's doing this not only just to get back at the people now he's gonna he's do doing it. it for money for his family right. for this guy's family yeah right he's but like he, i think he's still giving him a side i kind of like, i'm i'm not the biggest fan of this but okay um i i think what he's concerned about is that um more or less that he could be dragging his family into something that's even more dangerous and he probably feels guilty because he had to recognize the guys that paralyzed him as the ones that like they had the tussle with already so i'm sure that's probably on his mind as well but i don't know i never got the feeling that his friend was visually trying to talk him out of it you know what i mean because they could still i don't know about talking him out of it i just don't think he liked it there you go well who wants to know that their friend is running around murdering people even if it is for revenge i mean probably you but that's fair i accept that <laughs> um so uh let's see here then um the uh cop believe it or not he who's kind of investigating all this he finds one of the girls who's one of the ladies from uh the the was at the gang headquarters uh the night eastland attacked and he takes her in for an interrogation because she's he pretends he's a john and she's uh of course uh hooking and uh then all of a sudden before you fucking know it uh you know he's got her and he can realize she's addicted to heroin 
so he kind of forces information out of her because she she needs her fix and he's not quite letting her out of this until you know he gets the information he wants typical scumbag piece of shit cop played by christopher george you have to have recognized him from all the movies that we've seen with him in them before i've i didn't recognize his face but i recognize his voice okay i'll accept that uh but christopher george has been on this show many a times and i'm grateful to have him back Yes, uh, I, I liked him. Wonderful actor. So then we cut to um, uh, the the boss man uh, from earlier who was talking about the comics. He's getting ready. They're going to go out to eat, but he's showing everybody his brand new attack dog that he's so fucking proud of. Um, Foreshadowing. Yeah, for, yeah, free time. Uh, so then they go out to eat, and he makes a crude statement about needing to uh, take a shit. So he says something like, before I get another meal, I want to, you know, I want to make room for it by getting rid of the other meal. So, uh... Yeah, he, he says it way more cruder than that. Yeah, and uh, and he laughs about it like he's the most hysterical man in the world. Um, wow, God, scatological really... humor that offended you. This guy must have yeah. been really evil. This guy really pissed me off. Um, he goes the bathroom with one of his other guards and he has the guard sweep guard look through no one there so the guy goes in and heads into the stall well we see that uh eastman where eastland was actually hiding in one of the stall or underneath a uh fucking um uh he was hiding underneath uh uh fucking the trash can he was hiding so somehow- inside the trash can underneath the trash bag somehow yeah yes yeah, somehow yeah so he crawls out so I thought he just had the trash can upside down, and I was like, how are you not checking that upside down trash can? I don't, I don't understand that. No, he was inside the trash can, pushed the bag and the lid up and out, and then stepped out and then put it all back super quietly. That's nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, those motions, I'm like, okay, so yeah, clearly he's been trained, even though I don't find him threatening, and that stuff was yeah. like, what was the scary, creepy shit? It was yeah. like how good he was at stealth. Exactly. And he had a... A syringe of some some knockout juice and boss comes out and he knocks out the boss all the while uh his, the boss's lady is hitting down one of his other guys who's sitting at a table with her um, that shit was so, hilarious because that always that, fucking happens oh yeah fucking it was great um so then uh the guy wakes up and eastlam has him tied right over a big meat grinder the guy says okay okay i'll help you and he goes i want the keys to your house and he gives him the keys and he goes i want the safe code and he gives him the safe code and i was really disappointed it wasn't one two three four five that's the kind of code that some idiot would put on his luggage. Might as well have to change my luggage code before I go on this trip. Anyway. Um, <laughs> that's... You're welcome for the setup. Thank you. And that's the end of that 20 minutes before we go to the next. All right. So well, if you have anything to add. Yeah. I meant to bring up Steve James at the first uh, 20 minute break, but I didn't get a chance. Uh, Steve mm-hmm. James is his friend who saved his life and shit. And Steve James has been in a shit ton of stuff i thought i recognized him uh, he's usually like the hero's sidekick but um in most of the cases like in this film you kind of want him just to be the hero yeah uh right. he i mean like the earliest thing i can think of seeing him in is um when they're at that uh bar in weird science right after lisa gets made and there's all those guys hanging out he's one of the dudes at the table that's with them and he's okay. in he's in a bunch and i mean a bunch of canon films like I, he's in the delta force he's in um like i think the second Second and third American Ninja, but not the first one. And then there's like American Ninja Warrior or American Warrior or some shit like that that he's into. Um, but he's always like the sidekick, like or or like the guy that fights alongside of or with. It's like the equal. Um, I know he's in the Hero and the Terror as well. And a good portion of our audience would be extremely upset if I didn't mention that he was Kung Fu Joe. And I'm gonna get you, sucker. <laughs> oh, okay, nice. Yeah. So I mean, like you would know you you you'd have to know Steve James when you see him like you have to kind of recognize him uh he was taken from us way too soon he died at the age of 41 in like the 90s oh that's terrible i know and it i don't know what how or why but like i feel like it was a promising career that we probably would have seen more uh if from I him yes money at age like that heart disease that wasn't recognized or cancer yeah one of the two that's usually the biggest uh killers of that young of an age but yeah yeah steve james is someone that we definitely had to talk about as well uh as Agreed. far as far as the plot line is going um, I'm still dubious on whether or not Steve James's character of Jefferson actually doesn't want him to take care of the family, but I get your point about how um, the danger is a factor and he may be very concerned with his family considering about well, how just one fight was the blowback that paralyzed him. And I always think like his buddy, who's the paralyzed one, he's the one who actually... Uh, 
you know, didn't have as tough of a time maybe getting back from Vietnam as maybe like uh, uh, Eastland did. You know what I mean? Well, and there's the flip side of it, too, that we may not be picking up what the movie's putting down. What if the movie is implying that McGinty's character is basically always just looking for a reason? And that, maybe, yeah. that Steve James's character of Jefferson has made it his life's mission to save the man by always being there and keeping him grounded and keeping him away from doing what he is clearly so fucking good at. Because the guy, the yeah. guy works at a meat Murder. plant and he's goofing off and he's having a good time and everything. But when yeah. when the chips are down and it's time to take care of some business, he is deadly and seriously fucking terrifying. Like d- d- and and like not ever second guessing his deadliness. That's even more deadly about him. When he decides, hey, it's time for murdering. Well, motherfucker, it's time for murdering. He's not really going to change his mind about that. Right. And while I was lamenting the lack of use of a flamethrower, I get what the movie's going at. Well, and it's that he is basically an an assassin, a trained assassin, or like a high level fucking he, merc of Rambo. some sort. Right. But he's loose on American soil. And then the film starts to imply later on uh, that there's even more going on with these two characters that they may be retired like government uh spooks <laughs> for the CIA yeah. you know it is a possibility that they they could be that even because or they maybe they're not even retired maybe they just got deactivated and went about their lives because there is some serious implications later on in the movie that uh Christopher George's character has to deal with um but anyway we kind of we talked about all of the that guy actors that are in this as well and we're about to meet a that lady actress for some of our listeners as well so let's move on <laughs> unless you got okay. something else you want to add uh no i got nothing so uh he breaks in to my boss's house and of course he hits a bull the dog it attacks um as you know anybody could see coming um and check off's dog yeah and so there's uh there's a fight and he kills the dog using a using a using a uh a, 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 a kitchen or a meat cutting saw almost like a turkey cutting saw electric but carving knife. electric knife electric knife yeah, it's an electric go. carving knife, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm glad that we didn't have to see it. The implication enough alone was like, God damn, exterminator. But like, Ugh. I get it. That dog was going to kill him. That was its sole yeah. purpose. And- yeah, that dog was raised just for the sole purpose of, of myrtleizing him. So Yeah, and the owner of the dog purposely didn't tell him about him because he was counting on the dog eating the guy alive and then him being found hanging there sometime. Yeah. <laughs> without getting chopped yeah, that's, up. Uh, that's a fact. <laughs> so um, he kills the dog. Um, and then, uh, we cut to, he comes back to, uh, you know, the, uh, the asshole, uh, gentleman, and he's like, mm, and without saying a word, he, uh, he drops that motherfucker straight into the, into the meat grinder. So, fuck off. That's what you get. It, I love that there are no words. He just showed up and dropped him. And the guy's like, oh, I gave you the keys, I gave you the code, and, yep, nope. You're dead. See you later, bitch. <laughs> I feel like he was going to murder him either way, but I think he would have given him a quicker death had he cooperated. Yeah, I think you may have just shot him. Right. Like, you know, you can't have him IDing him or whatever. And this but, uh, this is also what we were talking about earlier. He's just so cold and just goes for it. He doesn't even like say anything yeah. to him. Like your normal character would like, you think that's fucking funny. Well, this is really fucking funny and then like killed him. Like he doesn't even yeah. have that. He doesn't even justify or talk to the guy or even tell him why or say anything that like your normal yeah, movie or character. Or get angry. Right. He has a, such a calm fucking face even. Right. He just basically said you did not fulfill your objective therefore you are now longer no longer useful for me and you are being yeah terminated that's all it is like it's yeah. just that uncaring that unfeeling he doesn't even bode any fucking anger at the guy for unleashing a dog on him and tricking him like he just he just yeah. like this guy dies now i got what i needed and he lied to me so he dies yeah it's just hey listen man yeah maybe next time don't fucking lie to me and be a prick uh well well, actually, I'm sorry. There's not going to be a next time. So we'll see you later, Big Shoots. <laughs> also, where were the fragments of shoe and uh, bits of material from his clothing that should have been in that meat when he was being ground up? Yeah, we don't we don't ask those questions. I asked those questions because it bugged me. Well, um, I don't have answers for you on those questions. How about that? <laughs> they just reused the same footage of it being ground up and they couldn't dirty it. I, I know. They, they yeah. just couldn't do that in the shot. It's fine. Well, now if you're going to have to be all fucking, yeah, I understand what's going on. 
I Don't mean, be understanding, Court. No one wants that. <laughs> look, they spent $400,000 on the opening of the film. They couldn't afford meat with fabric particles in it. <laughs> all right, there you go. That's that's fine. I think we're all happy now. Um, I know I'm being a dick, but I do really like this movie. <laughs> I know, I do too. <laughs> so, okay. All right, so then we cut to uh, the cop visits one of the victims from the original gang attack when he, when he shot up the gang, who apparently... Uh, uh, the guy he shot must have survived, um, but he's never waking up or anything like that. He seems to be completely bedridden. And the doctor kind of is like, oh, I suppose this is how you like your victims. He goes, hey, I'm just trying to find out who did this. And he and the doc end up striking up a, a nice little conversation. The doctor is the lady I was referring to earlier. That is Samantha Egar. She is actually the uh, actress that I said that we would have seen before. She was mm-hmm. in... The David Cronenberg movie that we covered with uh, Duncan, The Brood. There it is. It came to me. It took me a second. Okay, so the David Cronenberg movie, The Brood. She was like the mother of all those weird mutant children and things like that. Um, oh, okay. Which is a very big turn from the type of role that she, apparently she had uh, ever done before. And in this, playing the love interest for Christopher George is quite interesting. I kind of like their little burgeoning romance, and it, it gives you the kind of levity you need because everything else in the film is a massive fucking downer. And their yeah. little love story is just the right little bit of pep and happiness you need. Still going to be a massive downer ev- eventually. But anyway. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a massive downer of a movie, but this helps you just get through it. That's a fact. There you go. I can I can, uh, I can, can agree with that. All right. So, uh, Lady of the Night gets picked up by a guy who's like, hey, you want some work? She's so sure. And she follows him to a place. And he's like, hey, uh, fortunately, the guy, the John they have is into some sick stuff. He likes to do things with little boys, apparently. But he wants a girl to do stuff with him with a dildo. That and guy's she... into what's called chicken hawking. He actually yes. looks for prostitutes that are underage males. Yes. Yes. Well, she doesn't want any part of it, thinks that shit's fucked up, which she's right. But they rough her up a bit. The John actually comes up and he's like, hey, I can help. And they push her into a bed and he makes a, he has an iron rod that he just steams up until and they just pretty much they start branding her. It's a soldering iron and they work her yeah. over and burn her body with a soldering iron. And thankfully the film cuts away and we don't have to look at it. Yeah, because oof, that's rough. I, and I was sitting there the whole time going, oh, fuck, are they going to make me watch this? Because Jesus Christ, I don't really want to. <laughs> yeah. Please don't. This sequence was actually shot in an actual whorehouse that had just been shut down by the cops. And then the cops allowed the filmmakers access in there. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Jesus. Yeah, that was another one of the little pieces of trivia I wanted to add in. So there you go. Oh, all right. There you go. Uh, nice. Uh, so, I mean, not nice, nice, but, you know, the, the trivia. Um, seriously ups their production value. Yeah. Better than any yeah. set they would have put together because that was an actual ill used one. And I don't know if you noticed, but they had to blur out some of the porn. Uh, I'm guessing that that shit is illegal now that was hanging on the walls that had to be blurred out. Oh, I'm sure you're right. Come to think of that. Oof. Yep. <sighs> Gross. All right. So, anywho, then we cut to the cop and his uh, lady friend, the doctor, are out on their date. They're just kind of, you know, talking to one another about uh, life for, I mean, lack of a better way of putting it. They just kind of have a date. It's nothing big. Uh, But again, it's the bit of levity that you need to keep you going in the film. Yeah. But then I just kind of how this film's already been. You get feeling really bad about that because it's like none of this can end well. Yeah. You start to wonder what's going to go on. And like, you're actually starting to question whether or not the cop is grooming her. And maybe he's some kind of evil fucking killer, too, because Christopher George's character is all weird and quirky and like you just don't trust him. Yeah, but my problem is not so much that I'm like, ah, you know, whatever. I, I'm just, I'm more afraid for them as, oh, well, no one can be happy in these movies. Well, it's New York in the 80s. No one was happy. Yeah, that's that's also true. Jesus Christ. That's about his, that's, that's from the mouths of babes right there. <laughs> That, you, know, you can't really say anything else other than that. Um, anyway, we cut to a news report, and that is our next clip. Good morning, I'm Roger Grimsby. Here now the news. Early today, the grizzled remains of a reputed meat mobster, Gino Pontavini, were found on the floor of a warehouse in the South Bronx, beneath a huge meat grinding machine. Now, police initially presumed this to be the work of a rival mob. However, a letter dropped off apparently late last night at Eyewitness News indicates another possibility. I quote from the letter. The people of New York have been terrorized by criminals for too long. Politicians have stood idly by as 
thugs and killers have taken over our streets, our parks, our lives. As of today, this will no longer be true. Gino Pontavini will not be the last. The letter is signed, The Exterminator. In other news, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came under fire once again and... Elections are just two months away. We really don't need this bullshit. Can you take care of it? What do you want me to do? I think the country would be better off if this lunatic were brought to justice. I see. Arrested, brought to trial. That's not necessarily what I had in mind. I didn't think so. Trial might raise some embarrassing issues. President's campaign promises, for example. An administration that hasn't brought about law and order in the last four years shouldn't be given a second chance. I asked you if you could take care of it. I'll take care of it. It'll be a lot easier if the New York police cooperate with us. I'll give their commissioner a call. So now the motherfucking CIA is involved getting orders from on high from someone that's got like di- directly connected to the goddamn president that they need yeah. to get law and order in, you know, going and all of that kind of shit, which is very similar to what happens in the original Death Wish when task mm-hmm. force start getting enabled and like, you know, Washington starts getting involved and in poking their nose in. But in this case, you get the feeling that the reason they don't want a trial isn't that they give a fuck that the guy's going to get arrested. The reason they don't want a trial is what does this guy going to leak out in order to get a more reduced sentence? Because apparently he's got a whole lot of dirt on this administration. Well, That's what I'm thinking. No, because I don't think they know who it's doing it. It's all purely, it's not even as insidious as you think, which actually makes it worse. It has nothing to do with what he knows because they don't know who he is. They just want him dead because it's making the administration look bad. This guy's out there killing bad guys, you know, killing uh, or men who break the law. And for four, the guy even says it for four years, this administration, which ran on law and order, provided none of it. And they're trying to run for a reelection now, and crime's worse than it's ever been. And now this guy's going around just killing people. It's making them look bad. The worst thing you could possibly do to any authority is make it show how much they're actually not doing. (laughs) Oh, wow. That comes back to what we were talking about with bad management. So we're back around again because it's bad management on a big scale with the president. And let's move on. Yeah, I'm just saying. There you go. So uh, Eastland, uh, he's walking around and a young lady picks him up. And we notice it's the same young lady who got taken in by the by the creeps. Um, Well, she takes him up to a room. He he can't. She kind of actually bring him around. She's like, come on. And he's like, nah. And she's like, come on. So they go. And he sees all the burn marks all over her body. And he says, hey, let's just get you dressed. And you don't have to be here anymore or afraid of these guys. He, he gets her to tell him wh- what what happened to her. And he says, you know, they, we, we, you don't have to be scared anymore to do any of this. Um, and then we see him doing a little montage of getting weapons together. And he's, he's uh, augmenting his bullets with mercury. This is the stupidest way to put mercury right. into a fucking bullet you can think of. Why would you put mercury into a bullet, Court? Mercury is a poison, but it also makes it to wherever the wound it splashes on cannot heal and you have to cut out the area that the mercury gets in because of the heavy metal poisoning and it continues to sort of like poison its way through you as it goes and in case in case of bullets whenever it's pushed inside of you like that and the bullet mushrooms out it also Mm -hmm. mushrooms out and throws the mercury everywhere pretty much guaranteeing a kill like even if you survive the initial wound that amount of mercury that's going to be spread through your body is going to poison you and you will die like he's trying to make bullets that are guaranteed kills as long as they hit damn that's my understanding of it now that was told to me by a fucking gun nut fanatic the accuracy of that i don't really know this is just some guy in the fucking hills that i wish would leave me the hell alone when i was a kid <laughs> <He> finds you <laughs> <laughs> no nah, he's just a neighbor of mine at the time i just wish he would stop talking about this kind of stuff and he scared the shit out of me but you know whatever he since moved thankfully for my parents but anyway um right. that's why you would put mercury in the bullets but if you're gonna do that um you you if he can do that he should be able to reload bullets he should be drilling out the fucking bullets and reshaping them and then putting them in, you know and then stamping them in and, and you know reloading the shells himself like that Maybe it doesn't make for as entertaining of a of a montage no and i'm sure there are people that do it like that but that is the dumbest least safe way you could ever try and load mercury into a bullet i'm just saying this guy ain't into safety court 
He's a badass. What's wrong with you? <laughs> no, it looks cool. It really fucking does. It's a great fucking sequence. I'm just saying that's a bad idea. Gotcha. Well, we start the next 20 minutes. Uh, he starts loading up some more guns. So he's got a shit ton of guns. Um, he goes to that fucking uh, house of ill repute. And uh, he knocks on the door and you know, gets in saying, hey, I got these kids and all that. And the guy lets him in. And then he knocks that motherfucker out. He... Takes him into a room, ties him to a bed. The guy wakes up pleading because, well, Eastland's just covering him in fucking lighter fluid. And it's fucking, to hear the guy beg and to be scared is maybe one of the better parts of this fucking movie. Um, You're kind of getting into it because you know this guy's a pedophile and pedals pedophilia to other pedophiles. So you're kind of pleased that he's freaking out and doesn't want to die this way. Uh, and <laughs> Wow. Okay, so the, the, the thing that Matt Psyop enjoys the most in this is watching a pedophile be burned alive and a guy who sells young boys into pedophilia against their will. I'm more into, not, well, not just that, but uh, also hearing them plead as they're about to die from it. <laughs> okay. So they're suffering. All right. So <laughs> you what you, I'm into. You definitely do have a vengeful streak to you. You just, I yeah. can for certain things, yes. And that's, that's, that's one of them. Apparently. <laughs> okay. Preying on the innocent and young and more the meek that, uh, that'll, that'll get me. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's one thing that gets me. Oh, I'm not playing so, devil. I'm not playing devil's advocate here. I'm just. Yeah, no, I know you're not. You're just saying, wow. You know, you I'm, found, I'm, found I'm, my level of where I don't mind watching someone get tortured. <laughs> right. We finally found your, your, uh, the, the dark side for you. Like where, where, yeah. it's, where the dark is okay. Where, where Matt feels. Yeah it's okay and and apparently Where I feels at home like a comfy <laughs> pair of shoes he lights up on fire the guy's screaming and it's just a you know it's just a good time had by all <laughs> everyone's happy uh, well the john who helped brand that lady with the with the fucking uh soldering iron he comes out of the room stares and uh you know he uh uh, unfortunately, Eastland makes eye contact with him, and Eastland follows him to the room, sees a young boy tied up, crying. So now you're tied doubly up, like... face down and naked to the yeah. bed. And you're like, all right, I want this motherfucker to die. And what I thought was the coolest way to kill him was, yeah, he shot him. He did shoot him, but he didn't shoot him like right where he would die right away. He shot him in the gut. So that's probably going to be a pretty painful way to die. He actually kind of shot him in the crotch and it went up through his gut because of how he was hunched yeah. over. There you go. But either way, that's a nice way. And it was with that's, the mercury. Good for him. It was the mercury full filled bullets. And I think they were trying to make it look like they were shooting him in the dick. But obviously, you're yeah. not going to put a squib on your dick. I don't care who you no. are. Yeah, no one's no one's into that. Right now. <laughs> um, Especially when all he had was boxers. I felt like the deaths should have been reversed, but um, all the lady probably fixated on was her pimp. So just knowing the story about the burning, and that was even her pimp. He asked her if, like almost like she thought it was a date for him, and then. Then it went fucking bad. That's how bad it was. It wasn't even her pimp. Right. But okay. So we only ever actually see the main guy that gets shot in the crotch, burning yeah. the girl with the soldering iron. So I were or to the other to, guy is holding her down. Yeah. Though, so. But are we led to believe that the other guy did it much worse? You know, when the John lost his stomach or, or something, because like the possibly, I don't think so. I think it was just, that was the first guy he ran into. And then the other dude just so happened to come out of his room at the wrong time so uh but it was the same guy right yeah same guy it's just he just happened to come out of the room at the wrong time if he would have stayed in his room maybe with the door locked he never would have known maybe maybe eastland doesn't take a walk around uh and find and if he cornered the john in there and let's say the john didn't have it wasn't the same john and he didn't have a little boy in there he might have gotten out of it alive and Eastland might have been like, fuck it, I don't care. I, you know, if it was just some adult woman in there and they were just having, you know, just... If it was know, an adult a, in a, there with him. Adult in there, you know, it's like, okay, well, you're just having a time to pay for. That's People do that. Um, I don't think it would have led to death, but he walked in there. I don't even think he knew that that was the other guy who helped brand, you know, branded her. I think he just knew about the, the main guy in the building. So... I think when he, but when he saw the little boy in there, he's like, okay, nope, that's, 
that's not happening and your congratulations you're dead the other thing so, i want the other thing i want to talk about is the only time you see robert mcginty's face change from that dead behind the eye just stare and like mm-hmm. just kind of like total like dead look and hate that's in his eye and it's when he sees this young man tied down like that and then he has a little bit of a flashback to being tied uh, up when he was tied up in vietnam in vietnam yes. and stuff but then he has a realization of what is actually happening and you can kind of see like this moment of like serious compassion and like Mm -hmm. he then starts hurriedly cutting him free and the way that mcginty's playing that i feel like he's haphazardly doing it because like he's panicking in this moment of like what's happening because he pauses to throw a towel over him and cover him up before he even starts on cutting him like or uh, you know untying him and cutting him free and the kid is still so traumatized and so terrified that he's gonna hurt him doesn't know if if this guy's also going to just molest him. You know, he doesn't know. Yeah. So he starts freaking out, but uh, he tells him, listen, you're going to be okay. And I'm going to get you out of here. You know, we're going to, we're going to leave here. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. So, um, I think that that's the, the only time that we really see any kind of like real human tenderness in this film from him is when he's dealing with his friend Jefferson's family. And then with this kid, that's it. Everything else. And the girl, and the girl he had, uh, he had a moment with. Yeah, because of her pain, I think he did connect yeah. with her, but I think it was just more or less he was bored and was going to hire a prostitute. Well, yeah, but then he saw her pain, and he was very concerned there, too. Yeah, okay, well, that's what brought him here as well. Um, I'll, I'll give you that, but like, I feel like the kid is the one that he actually connected with. It was just, this was another job that he was on, too, because of what these guys did, and he was going to make sure he took care of her. Like, I yeah. still felt he was kind of cold with her compared to the way he was with the kid. I don't know. I felt he was warm enough, but I think he was definitely warmer to the kid because it's a little bit more egregious. This kid was pretty much kidnapped off the street. And, and also, um, I think the shock and horror of what was of happening kid. for the also, kid. Yeah. He saw her branded where he saw the kid was tied up, which triggered his PTSD. Yes. That's another so. thing we need to really talk about. His character is very clearly suffering from PTSD. He's suffering from PTSD. De- definitely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's almost like he channels it into what he's doing as the exterminator or two i think is what the film's trying to imply yeah oh it definitely it's definitely filtered into what he's doing there all right so the cops come onto the scene and that's our next clip listen can we just come in and take a quick no. look around now you know the rules you know one in there till the mink is here listen dalton what do you have on this i just got here judy i don't know give me a break come on dalton you're here it's gotta mean one thing the exterminator First one was Jonathan Minor, age 37, male, Caucasian. 42 arrests for promoting prostitution, assault, rape, white slavery, corrupting the morals of minors. Lately, he specialized in young boys. He was convicted twice and served a total of 18 months. Jesus, it looks like he got hit by a napalm. Most of that's from the burning mattress. The fireman said it's like that every time someone falls asleep smoking. Step this way, I'll show you our next attraction. Who was he? He was a state senator from New Jersey. Hey, Dalton. Yes, Steve. I have the autopsy on the third ghetto gould and the printout that you ordered. I also have a telephone message from the CIA. The CIA? Yeah. An agent Shaw called. He wants a briefing on the exterminated case. He says he cleared it with the commissioner. Yeah, he left his number. Thanks, Steve. All right. Dalton. Hi, it's Megan. Oh, hi. How are you? How's it going? Oh, it's going fine. Our lab boys picked up a bloody footprint in the uh, meatpacking plant. They uh, matched it with a size 10 hunting boot manufactured by a firm in Maine that only sells mail order. Well, our computer checked their records of all sales of that size with army records. And we finally have us suspects. Why do you think he was in the army? Well, uh, one of the ghoul's girlfriends picked out the M16 machine gun as a weapon the, exec- uh, the exterminator used when he broke up their party. Well, the only way you can, you can get one is stealing it from the army. You think you're going to catch him? Oh, well... We'll catch him, all right. But it's going to take some doing. The computer gave us 2,000 suspects. 
Well, it's going to take a lot of knocking on a lot of doors. What are you doing right now? Uh, well, I'm uh, just going over some lab reports and just looking for clues. Do you want to take a break? Yeah. Well, there's a good jazz concert at Battery Park. All right, I, uh, I can be there in about 30 minutes. Good. Okay, see you there. All right, so, um... The cop and the doctor, they go out, and the, we find out from this cop, he also is a Vietnam vet. And so they kind of talk about that. They also have a meetup with an old friend of hers, and you know, you can tell she's like probably a hippie love child, and because she, she's like, yeah, he's a cop. And the lady's like, yeah, yeah, you were with the cop. That's a, you always had a wicked sense of humor. So you tell maybe she was more anti authoritarian, uh, anti authoritative, and then he's, you know, now a cop. But yeah, it feels like they're trying to type thing. It feels like they're trying to set up a situation comedy yeah. where it's like, you know, the fascist pig meets the uh, people's right, this activist, and they fall in love. You know, can they make it work even though they're from different worlds of oppression <laughs> and different sides of the battle of yeah, oppression? Right. Yeah. And I would say, no, they can't. Um, <laughs> right. But that's kind of what they're hinting at here. It feels yeah. like it. It's like their their whole meet cute, like, oh, they shouldn't work, but they do somehow kind of bullshit. Yep, you know? I agree. Yeah. So um, anyway, then we see three guys. Guys, uh, including uh, the guy that uh, Eastland had interrogated, but apparently let go. They're bullying, and, and then they rob an old lady. Uh, this guy in a bike, he pulls over a motorbike, and he tries to check on it, um, and they push him away. Uh, but they leave, and he checks on her. And as he's checking on her, all of a sudden, Eastland shows up, kind of holds him at gunpoint so he doesn't turn around, and then takes the guy's bike. He catches up to the group. And kills the lead guy, who was the guy who he interrogated. Um, and he chases the other two until he crashes the bike. Those two then, it turns out, he now he's getting chased by those two in a car. But they kind of slip up, crash a little bit. But then they're coming right at him as he kneels down. But he pulls out his gun, kills the driver. The car crashes. He walks up to it, shoots it a couple times, and it blows up. That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Uh, I was into I was into all that. <laughs> it's weird that he like, jacks that guy's fucking motorcycle for trying to help the old lady out when they mug the old I lady. I think he's just trying to catch up to those assholes, though. Yeah, and I it's they just mug this fucking old lady, and then the guy tries to help. They hold him back with a knife. He goes to help her. Then he just jacks the guy's fucking bike. And I know yeah. that I know that the, it was just a means to the end and everything. But like he's kind of really so cold, he just fucking like leaves the guy there, and then the old lady's helpless too, just because he's in pursuit of these guys he doesn't even care about them is what i'm getting at yeah i mean it kind of you see it kind of that way or he thinks you know what the lady's fine now she's with this guy i can go kill these motherfuckers and then i'll just leave the bike somewhere for the guy to get it <laughs> yet he uses it for the rest of the film so that's not how it works well you never know uh anyway <laughs> he um so then uh as they're checking through everything the cia dude comes up and he you know tells them how hey it's the election year we just want to try to wrap this up you know a lot of people can be embarrassed he just says you know what uh, the cop says you know you're kind of full of shit pretty much is what he says doesn't believe a word the cia agent says he walks away and the, he gets a phone call and he she, uh, it's his doctor friend and she invites him for some midnight loving at the hospital she has an all night shift but they have a what they, they call midnight receiving in which they have an empty room that they can you know get down in if you're working with your significant other and that's the end of that 20 minutes leading into the final 20 minutes all right so we kind of already tied had it out about the whole thing with the motorcycle i think he just fucking told it and didn't even care about them because he's so bent on killing this whole gang and that's it that could be <laughs> but justified justified uh justified leaving a helpless old woman who was beaten profoundly and a man too terrified to get up to check on her after his fucking bike gets drove away there, uh no he was checking on her everything's fine <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you're I think you're losing it a bit here. You, you need to you need to think better of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying I love how fucking dark this is. And even though yeah. you're arguing otherwise, I don't think he gave a shit about those people. He's so hell bent on vengeance at this point, And that's it. Well, that's what you think. Uh, yeah, he probably doesn't. He, he cares about them in the sense of, hey, wrong is being done to those innocent people. But it's not so much. Let me take care of them. It's let me kill the people who wronged them. Kind of like probably how Batman views victims in gotham 
I don't think he really cares about him, but he cares more about the city as a whole. Yeah, but he'd be at least like radioing Alfred or somebody to direct some kind of ambulance there. He just jacks the guy's only means of getting help and leaves them. Well, I mean, they're not like in the middle of nowhere. They're in a city. He can run probably to pay phone. Or it's something. New York in the 80s. It was empty and desolate, especially where they were. You're not justifying it, man. He just fucking abandoned them. I'll justify it any way I see goddamn well please not to me you won't let's move on and finish this <laughs> i don't know I, I lost all of that halfway through that all right final 20 um uh the uh cop and uh the doctor lady they sneak into a room we see uh eastland is at the hospital and he's visiting his friend and that's our final clip i finally got maria to accept the money so she and the kids should be okay I heard about the doctor's report. And that you wanted to see me right away. I guess we never did bullshit each other very much, did we? So listen, if you want me to cut you off this uh, system here, I will. Blink your eyes twice, if that's what you want. Ooh, dark. Well, he does blink twice, and so, unfortunately, his friend then starts crashing. Then, um, he's kind of leaving, and everybody, the doctor, everyone's kind of rushing out of that room and rushing out of the rooms because they hear the crashing unit. Uh, the cop is trying to get his pants all done right back up, and he sees Eastland. You know, he doesn't know who Eastland is, but he sees him in the, um, uh, in the, uh, uh, elevator as he's getting ready to go down and he slim makes a crack about the guy's fly being down they might want to button it up and he was like ah shit wow well, okay and he was fixing his fly you know he kind of the cop was you could tell he's thinking but he's probably all discombobulated because you know he's now probably got blue balls he's trying to figure out what the fuck he's gonna do with himself and um oh he had three already and she had none it was the 80s it's true um and then uh, when the doctor comes back out, she's uh, the uh, the cop asks, hey, is that the one guy from the attack earlier this week? And she's like, yeah. And he goes, damn it. And he goes, the man who just left, he knows he's the exterminator. So they make a quick run. He tries to catch him, but of course he doesn't. Um, Eastland then uh, goes to his buddy's wife and lets her know that, unfortunately, he's passed on. He died. And, and she's kind of flipping out. She's like, no, he, 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 he could have been saved all this kind of stuff or i thought he was gonna do he's gonna be fine and eastland's trying to calm her down saying hey listen it's you know this is, he wouldn't have wanted to live that way anyway um you know because he knows for a fact he didn't want to live that way uh it also feels like he's trying to justify what it is that he's just done and you can see oh, the guilt on his face like he feels terrible you can tell he yeah he feels bad but i mean he can justify it the guy literally asked him to do it so uh then we see cops storm eastland's apartment and find nothing there um there are some sharpshooters up on the roof and eastland actually sees him as he's coming home he's like oh look at those bastards so he leaves and uh he actually calls his apartment and the detective answers and he says listen um how about this you want me meet me at this location it's a shipyard 3 a.m uh don't bring anybody else or else i'll kill her is how he says it so he's playing off that he has a um a, a, a hostage which he of course does so then we see the cia guy he gets a phone call somebody informing him of this meeting um they couldn't get a trace on the call though because it wasn't long enough so somebody is tipping him off as it looks like um eastland's getting ready to give him his gun uh the cop the cop gets shot in the chest um, we see CIA guy has a sharpshooter with him, um, and he keeps shooting, and the cop tells Eastland just to run, and he'll cover him. Uh, he tries to go to cover him, but the cop gets shot again. Eastland gets shot a couple times. He falls off the boat into the water. CIA guy's like, hey, that's, that's good work. We're done here. Everything's done. Uh, credits start playing, and we see Eastland washes up on shore, walking out of the water so he's alive but you know kind of just everyone's dead yay roll credits 
Yeah, there's no real happy ending. There's no real winning in this film. It's just he got enough money together to take care of his friend's family. And yeah. then that way his friend knew that he could be at peace. Um, and, and I'm everyone else lost. Yeah, and I'm guessing the prognosis was he was going to be um, paralyzed from Vegetable. the neck down for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. Or worse. And that he's not he's even going to be able to communicate. He's going to need help trying to breathe you know what i mean yeah so that's why he chose the path that he chose and i can understand that ginty being the one to deliver that for him because you know he, he owes him that kind of a debt he owes him a life yeah and, and this is a really fucked up way to have to repay him um i i still get the sensation that mcginty was always just like you know one small wind blowing in the right direction away from this kind of violence anyway like because he just revels in it a little too much you know and i don't think he was until his first kill and then he started reveling in it like, God damn, it was nothing. He didn't feel anything else. It just happened the way it happened. So there you go. Okay, I could kind of see that, but maybe he was in denial about it. And, you know, it took his, you know, it took him taking somebody out because of what happened to his friend for him to realize it. And I, I still feel that that's what was making his friend worry more than anything <laughs> was just how it much this guy been, yeah. was liking it. Because, like, he's been in war and he knows what that's like. He's seen that he kind of blood sick. His- and he did explain to his buddy how it was just like the war, man. It really didn't. I, he was like, I didn't feel anything. So yeah, right. And when I'm, yeah. when I, which I'm sure Jefferson, you know, felt everyone he killed, even though he knew he had to do it, and it was his, you know, duty to survive, or he was protecting himself for someone that he cared about or whatever that he would justify it in his head, I'm sure he still kind of carries some of those ghosts with him. Whereas oh, I'm sure. McGinty's character apparently was just looking for an excuse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to the next film, unless there's anything else you got on that. So No, I got nothing. All right, uh, Exterminator 2 comes out about four years later, and as we already talked about, Canon Films picked it up, so there's this whole other group of trivia on top of that as to what happened with that. But first... Here's the fucking music for Exterminator 2. style synth will always have a special place in my heart because of these kinds of exploitation films like Exterminator 2. Nice. The Exterminator. Yeah. Now, Exterminator is definitely an exploitation film, and it is the old school style, real gritty, grimy style from the years before. It just so happened to be made in 1980. But Exterminator 2 is very much a canon exploitation style film where they pick up the mantle and make it even more insane, and that is evidenced in its trailer. New York City. Robert Ginty cleaned up the streets in Exterminator 1, and the city has been quiet until now. Just innocent people getting hurt. No matter what you think, no matter what you say, nothing you can do. Maybe. You crazy? I'm crazy? Come on! I ain't crazy, but I'm mad! You hear me? I am mad! Robert Ginty, one man pushed to the limit, fights back in Exterminator 2. All right. See, just like I said. Yes, Exterminator 2. Uh, this is going to be a very quick review, too, because it's an hour and 20. Well, it says hour 29. It's really about an hour and 20. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like it an hour 22 packed. with seven <laughs> minutes of credits. And it never yeah. fucking lets up, yeah. Yeah, and it's more action than talking. So, first 20 starts. Uh, we see Eastland's listening to a police scanner. Um, 
we then see a bunch of assholes. They're robbing a store. Uh, it's an old couple who owns it. And you really start to feel bad because, oh, my God. Again, this is kind of where you itch my fucking, I hope you all die painfully uh, itch there. Uh, well, uh, the one guy kicks the old man down on the ground. Says because this is because he embarrassed him and fills him throat full of bullets. And you're like, fuck you. And then as his wife cries over him, uh, another guy says no witnesses and shoots her in the, in the fucking hip, by the way. Holy Jesus. Um, yeah, she may not die from that. Yeah, but she probably did. Just loss of blood and how old she is. The shock would have just killed her. Um, so anyway, they run out into this alleyway. Then all of a sudden you see, I mean, it's Eastland, uh, but he's in a, he has a wielder's mask on, but he's got his flamethrower. Uh, out of the four, he nabs two of them. Lights them the fuck up, burns them to a crisp. They scream and run about, and you feel really happy about yourself for about five minutes because these uh, sick-ass fucks are going to die painfully. I'm assuming dying by fire is probably not the best way to go. Um, <laughs> the, reason he's wearing, less. the reason he's wearing Bricks. the water's mask is that um, it's going to protect him from the heat because the flamethrower that he yes. is using now is so much bigger than the flamethrower that he had. Also, he's incorporated bulletproof uh, because they actually shoot at him and he takes the shots just fine right he's wearing a flak jacket now yeah so uh he's incorporated some new stuff into his deal Um, this movie makes sure it starts off right off the bat by giving you exactly what you think you're gonna see on the poster yeah yeah you get exactly what you want in this uh in this film if what you want is a guy burning people alive horribly with a flamethrower then yes you get what you want wasn't that what we always want that's definitely what i want in a film called exterminator 2 from 1984 fucking a all right so we're there um so uh later on at the gang headquarters they watch the news report about the exterminator possibly being back a ton of those guys you see in here mario uh, van peebles no, being one of them <laughs> yeah i was about to say no more than mario van peebles who ends up being the gang leader well one of the guys uh, and it's actually the leader's brother who is a part of the heist at the uh at the the convenience store tells mario that hey listen this guy showed up we couldn't see his face but he lit up two of the guys who are now dead and tells him like everything uh getting that's happened we then cut back to eastland he's at a bar he's having a drink he meets a lady and uh they uh they head to her place and you know i guess they just talk for a bit and have a good time you don't really see what they do they just head to her place so eastland's trying to move on with his life uh yeah and he's this is the lady he watches dance right and then they just kind of like hit it off because she's look she's staring at him while he's yeah. watching her dance yeah he's watching her dance right and she's noticing him from the stage which is that same kind of bullshit fantasy that every dude comes up with like that yeah. she's gonna notice yeah. you yeah. out of all the other and, people in the audience and and he can then you know you can save her yeah, it's all that horseshit. <laughs> right. Because can... she, she, she wants to be saved by you. <laughs> <laughs> More horseshit. Yeah, right. Fuck wad. So, anyhow. <laughs> um, all right. So, then uh, we have the gang meeting, and that's our first clip. Papers call them animals. Well, maybe they're right. Maybe we, maybe we all are animals. But look where they make us live. Yeah. We're going to change all that. We're not going to move from the streets. We're going to take over the streets. We're going to sneak up behind the man and take what's rightfully ours. This is a new era, a new time. No more petty theft. No more liquor stores. Tonight, half a million dollars. An armored car. Power! That's what this is about, power! That money will buy us enough magic powder to cover the streets like a blizzard. A blizzard of power! And it's only the beginning. We will establish a new order. This city is ours. I am declaring war! My destiny and yours is to fight for what should be ours. Ours. And to die if we must in the pursuit of that cause. I am the Messiah and you are my warriors. Together we should take what I want. I want everything. All of it. Including this uh, exterminator. The blood of the city flows through our veins. 
We are the children of the streets. We have grown up to control the very streets that pounded us down along with the filth and the garbage that ran in its gutters. We set fire to the streets. Everything will burn. We will build it up again. We will control it. Pick up it, my brothers. Feel the power that we all have when, when we are together. Feel the power surge through your bodies. Our body. Together we are all powerful. And together, together I will rule. I don't see how that's good for all of them when he's saying, I will rule, I will rule. Well, I think as long as they, uh, you know, he keeps them in vices or at least in control for them, it's probably okay. Yeah, okay. I can kind of see that. So uh, we need to talk about this gang. Um, They came right out of an Italian apocalypse film, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I they, they they all have their own style. That's, uh, that's for sure. Uh, Mario Van Peebles' outfits were designed by him, FYI. You know what? I can see that. I am not shocked. <laughs> yeah, nor am I. And that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm not shocked by that. All right. Your particular did- taste will dictate to you whether or not you feel he did an okay job at costuming himself as a yeah, leader of a gang. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, or just so we could all see how many sit ups he probably does. Uh, either anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. 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 His abs just were saying. on prominent display for a lot of this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't the only one seen on that, any of that. So, anywho. <laughs> I mean, if you're into those kinds of washboard abs, he's got the stomach for you. That's for sure. He's like, well, it's like eight of them right there. It's like <laughs> eight abs. It's like, you can tell he does do like 60 minute abs, not not that 59 minute abs. So, anyway, um, they do the armor car robbery. Uh, they drag the guy out of, you know, the, the driver out, and they're like torturing him by the side of the road. Um, as they're doing this, a police copter shows up, and they fucking are able to shoot it down. So, yeah, these guys aren't to be fucked with, I guess. You know, you can shoot down a police copter. Eh, you you got a little you got a little muscle behind you. This is not an ordinary street gang, considering the ordinance that they have their hands on already. Yeah, yeah, agreed. They are. They're a post-apocalyptic fucking biker gang in the middle of New York yeah. City in the 80s. Yep, I agree. I could totally agree. Uh, it's insane. Um, so anyway, <laughs> <I love it. laughs> um, yeah. Oh, of course you love it. I mean, you love to see it. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's the only thing good about any of this. <laughs> and uh, I mean, not the movie, but good about, you know, how these people are acting, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, we see a tr- uh, uh, trash driver, trash truck driver. He's a... Uh, he sees kind of all this happening. He's like, oh, shit, they're robbing the armored car. And so, he, believe it or not, he's able to fucking kind of blow his way past them all. And really kind of helps fuck everyone up. Uh, and, you know, he doesn't kill anybody, but he disturbs them enough so they have to escape. Unfortunately, they escape with the fucking driver. Uh Oh, uh, can we talk about the helicopter pilot real quick? Um, how they just watched him burn alive for an extended period oh, of time. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have brought that up. Yeah, yeah. They, they did do that, definitely. Yeah, it's really fucking grim. And it's seriously, like, this is, like, end of the world biker gang from, like, Dawn yeah. of the Dead in the middle of the 80s, like, right there in New York. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, I saw Exterminator 2 before I saw The Exterminator, and I saw it at an extremely young age. I was convinced that all cities were like this from a very, very very young single digit age because of this film wow so anyway uh then uh we see the group later on uh they are walking and they have the pretty much a subway driver somewhat crucified he's not like nailed but he's tied to a board and they're carrying him that's still crucifixion he's begging to be let go it's still crucifixion what? it's still crucifixion it's still, yeah. it's still crucifi- okay he's crucified he is a fixed uh, to a cross therefore it is a crucifixion all the while, the little brother of the leader, he's up in the trees. He's going to be watching out for the exterminator. And he, he you'll see he does a piss poor job of that. So anyway, uh, he uh, they take him down and they uh, paint like a red X on him. And so there you go. I mean, and then they drag him down. He keeps asking to be let go. And they, as a train comes, they throw him down on the rails so he gets electrocuted and then ran over by a train. Uh, and so while that's happening, 
uh, as the little brother's up in a tree, we see Eastland shows up, and and he's in his mask and with a flamethrower. And the kid tries to get away. He's like, oh, shit. And Eastman lights him up, burns him to the death. It burns him to the death? To the death. So, yeah, <laughs> that ends that 20 minutes. Okay. Um. So I, I think that was the opening 20 minutes. So, yeah, there you go. So the opening 20 minutes, man, you're just action-packed already. And this is one of the things I kind of like about these films. And I didn't really touch on it at the end of the first one, but I'll touch on it kind of now. Okay. If you're just... I was somewhat in when we started this, and we're watching, and I was watching it. I was somewhat in for some mindless action movie, but, like, not regular mindless action movie, like extreme violence action movie, and kind of got that. It was, it found me, these movies found me just in the right mood last night. So that's why I enjoyed them so much. I'm like, this is mindless. It's not asking you to think too terribly fucking hard about life or anything. It's, these are bad men. They're severely bad men. And now you're going to watch a guy kill him. Well, yeah, we had to watch it before Halloween at some point. And, yeah, yeah, right. And or um, on Halloween, in my case, I had to watch them both to get them uh, done in time to do the show. And we're doing it right after a big weekend, which is, you know, my Halloween party and everything. So for me, it's, yep. it's a lot of work and a lot of shit. So, yeah, I purposely chose this is my full franchise fest because I knew it was just going to be a fun time and I could just sit back and relax and enjoy watching it. What I didn't yeah. realize was that it was going to be way darker than i remembered it oh i mean yeah it was dark there there that's there's no way past that it's it's fucking horrifically dark and it is that's why i said ultra it, i was in for a mindless action movie but not regular action it kind of hit a really important niche for me because it was i was in for something i was like i want something really fucking just intensely fucking violent well it's kind of how i get at the end of fucking halloween anyway i i tend yeah. to want to watch more gritty exploitation and somewhat based in reality and no supernatural style gritty exploitation um, oh yeah i get in that kind of a mood so that's kind of why i picked this also for the full franchise mm -hmm. fest this this time around um since it's right after halloween that that's part of it but also like i just when i when i picked the movies i was thinking about the various aspects and i'll, I'll kind of reveal it now and I'll, I'll start talking about it here i rented exterminator 2 thinking that it was the sequel to like a full moon movie i think it was called like the terminators or some bullshit like that <laughs> which was a little that's more geared title. towards kids yeah no it wasn't called the terminators i was about to say because man you gotta you gotta do a lot to get away with that shit <laughs> oh it was uh i believe it was eliminators Ah, uh -huh. yeah from 1986 right so i had seen that as a kid and it was like uh, a cybernetic guy fighting with some other warriors in the future and then i saw the cover of exterminator 2 and it looked like a guy that was somewhat cybernetic with a flamethrower in the background the way the apocalypse looked in the background it looked like it was a post-apocalyptic film like the eliminators so i thought as a five-year-old kid that this was the sequel to eliminators and i took it to my mom and showed her the 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 movie and i said i think it's a sequel to that movie i like you know when i was telling her what was happening with it I'm like see it's got another robot guy and it looks like it's in the future too and she looked at it and she said it's rated r i don't know and i said yeah i think the other movie was too but it was all for violence and you're okay with that right mom and it was actually pg <laughs> nice um she said okay we'll get it but i'm gonna watch it with you and if i think it's too much we're gonna stop it okay and i'm like all right mom so my mom sat down with me when i was like maybe five or six years old and watched this entirety of this movie all the violence all the grew all the horrific shit that happens in it and continued to ask me if i was okay because it was too much for her and i said yeah mom sure i'm good i was fine the whole way through this film like it was yeah. never too extreme for me like at all like i just i got it i, I could tell my good and my bad guys and all of that that kind of stuff and it wasn't until probably when i bought the blu-ray from shell factory when it was released that i realized this wasn't a post-apocalyptic film <laughs> and not only that <laughs> that it was a sequel to an actual film called the exterminator oh my god because all i remembered Great was the stuff. cover from that age when i was a kid and i bought it solely like i saw the cover i remembered the cover i had that memory and i'm like exterminator 2 purchase and then i'm like holy shit exterminator 2 so i'm like i guess i gotta watch the first one right so i went back and i found that and i bought the synapse blu-ray of that in the same day yeah <laughs> and now here we are talking about it all these years later so i just want to kudos to my mom as a parent right for realizing that i was okay with it and i could make it through it and that it was a film that i chose and she let me watch the whole fucking thing. She covered my eyes for some stuff. I do remember that. 
Oh, I mean, yeah. That's what a parent's going to do a lot of times. Right. I just want everyone to know, like, the stuff that you think you would cover your child's eyes for, I am sure she covered my eyes for. Yeah. But she let me enjoy, quote unquote, the story and let me finish it. She let me watch the whole of the movie because my mom trusted me to make my own choices. <laughs> but was <laughs> but was also there to decide what I could and could not see when the film was playing, too. Yeah, right. Well, at least your mom let you make choices. Important choices for you. I believe Exterminator 2 is what turned Court into what he is today. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Not at all. Yeah, I was about to say, really? No. Exterminator 2, you don't say. No. Uh, there's some more trivia and stuff about this. Uh, this film is deeply chopped up. Uh, Canon Films, the producers, wanted actual more flamethrower stuff because in the film, there was original cut of the film. They weren't really delivering very much, if any, because in the other film, there wasn't a lot or yeah. any really stuff with the flamethrowers. So all of the scenes where he has that fireproof sort of like a welder's mask on and he's burning a gang member with a flamethrower they're not in the original cut of the film those are all added during reshoots oh wow really which is why in the later on in the film when they're like the guys with the garbage truck and the guy with the blowtorch are the same guy Mm -hmm. like the guy with the blowtorch they had to put that in to make all the other scenes make sense that he's burning everybody alive the thing with the brother and him freaking out about his brother you know and all of that um you know so like later on when mario van people's character uh starts you know going after another gang member um they talk about his brother but then (laughs) he's more upset about of another character than dies as well and the reason that that is and the the, some of this stuff is super confusing it doesn't make a lot of sense and just feels like non-stop action wall to wall is because they kept reshooting more and more violence and throwing in more violence until they got an X and then they started pairing it back. Oh, well, come on. Violence for America, <laughs> fucking god damn it. Yeah, so this film got pushed to as far of a limit as they possibly could and then pulled back to be a hard R. And yeah. with a few minor uh, adjustments of covering my eyes at certain points, my mom still let me watch it. And thanks, mom. I love you. <laughs> All right. The next 20 minutes. So the trash guy, he's out there, and uh, he's uh, he's enjoying his day, enjoying his work, just having a good time. He seems happy to be alive, um, and uh, just uh, just living his life, you know. Uh, so you kind of already like this guy. Um, <laughs> you're like, all right, well, this guy could, you know, there's nothing wrong with him. Uh, that actor also just plays these he's kinds a, of characters. He's an everyman. Yeah, yeah. But he specializes in the likable guy. That BG character, like that, is the kind of character that he normally plays. Obviously, not a guy that is going to, um, you know, start vigilanteism with a garbage truck. But yeah, like the having fun and laughing and you know being a good friend and just like trying to take care of everybody. Like that's his bread and butter as a character yeah. actor. Usually, uh, uh, totally agree. Yeah, that's definitely the kind of stuff he's into. Yeah, so, Frankie uh, Faison, I believe is. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but th- is his name? I think you're right. Yeah. Um, but good enough. Uh, hey, it's it's nice to see him. Uh, so anyway, um, then uh, we see Eastland's walking down the street, and some guy's asking him for money. He goes, "I don't have any." He goes, "I'm busted." He goes, "Please, you're holding the Rolex." And he goes, uh, "So then." Uh, Eastland actually sells the guy the Rolex for 200 bucks. Well, the trash guy named BG, he actually sees Eastman and he knows him. He tells him to get his ass into the car and the truck. So Eastman does, of course, because, hey, he knows this guy too. And I think it's uh, another guy who he was in Vietnam with, obviously. Yeah, that's the only friends that he's ever going to make, Eastland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We cut back to the gang and they're underground. They're meeting with a bunch of what looks to be old style gangsters, mobsters. So I just called them mobsters because, fuck it, we have gangsters we have the gang and then we have mobsters that's just that's just how i'm gonna roll they are making a deal what it's going to be is the gang they rob the armor car because they got this money now and they give it to the gangsters and they want drugs so the gangsters make sure like the money's real they're not taking it yet and then they said later on we'll drop off uh another uh like a sample of the drugs because now that we know the money's real you can get this sampling of drugs to see if it's you know something you're you're into here uh, then we see this guy, uh, we cut onto the street and one of the gangster guys, he's watching this guy on skates do all these tricks and dancing and everything. People are leaving him money while well, the guy leaves that guy, the drugs. And so that guy takes off on his skates. The dude with the skates was actually a street performer that they discovered for the film and put in there. And so all oh. of the, yeah, I guess his name was like slow-mo was his, uh, performance. He was, he played the character eyes. That's the guy who, oh who, nice, yeah, but, um, or slow motion or 
Slow Mo, or, or I've, I think was like the nickname that he went by. And it's because he could do that sort of dancing thing where he could make yeah, it look like he was moving in, with his skates. Moving. Yeah, in yeah. slow motion. And it's really impressive. And they they sure as fuck get a lot of production value out of making that guy dance down staircases and do all the stuff that he can do. And I'm sure as a street performer, he was probably making way more on this movie than what he normally would pull in, you know, in a day. But that's how they discovered him was performing that stuff on the street. Yeah. Well, he brings it into the game leader and the game leader then tells him they need someone to test it on because they're not going to try to use it themselves. And just when you thought you couldn't hate these fucking kids from the apocalypse anymore, my God. Yeah, yeah, you're going to start hating these kids even fucking more. Uh, so then we see uh, yeah, Eastland and BG. They're talking about uh, Eastland sees uh, BG's dog takes. And he goes, I can't believe you still wear them. And he goes, you know, the war's over. And he goes, no, it's it's not over. Uh, that's what BG says, that the war's not over. So BG knows kind of what these streets are. And uh, he's, he's, he's not a fan of them either. So uh, then we see Skate Man. He comes up behind this nice young couple and grabs the girl and skates off. All the while, the guy tries to chase. But, of course, you know, the guy's on skates, so he can't catch up. Um then uh, they uh, they take her, he takes her back to the gang's base. They pump her full of the drugs, and they see that it gets her high as shit. So they're like, all right. So the leader's like, listen, we're going to go ahead. We're going to start. We'll exchange the drugs and everything. Then we're going to start, you know, we're going to start taking out the competition. You know, we're going to start really ruling this place. And then he pretty much lets his guys have their way with the girl. You don't see it, but it's heavily implied that's getting ready to happen one of the so. guys basically asks for it ahead of time and yeah. then x pretends to be all pissed off but once he knows that she served her purpose which like why did he need to kidnap somebody off the street why couldn't they have just gotten a junkie to test it on well maybe they need to know you know like uh hey maybe a junkie couldn't tell you how high he's getting off of it oh blade needed to know how high a normal person would get off of it and if they yeah. would die from a, a what would be a normal dose Yes, exactly. I think it was just an excuse to show how bad this fucking gang is that they kidnap, uh, drug, and rape her because that's what happened in Death Wish 2, so they had to put it in this. Yeah, I, I mean, you're you're obviously very right on that. But I'm just saying, <laughs> just trying to play, you know, for the uh, production crew, devil's advocate of what these guys were actually doing and reason maybe why they would do this. How much of a dick am I if Death Wish 2 was actually after this? Really? Nope, oh. it was before it. It was before? Okay. Well, then you're not a dick at all. So. I'm still kind of a dick, but I mean, it, but Canon did not that. Not about this. Canon did that very often where they would make sure that they, if, they, if it worked, put it in another film, you know? Oh, I got you. Yeah. And you know what? They're not wrong. If it works, put it in another film. They basically well, just, yeah. It, Exterminator 2 is basically Death Wish 2 with a guy with a flamethrower. We said it before, and that's exactly what we're getting. But we're getting yeah. this bonus of this dude, BG, who's an upbeat, happy-go-lucky, fun-loving guy who also is going to fight crime with a garbage truck. How badass is that? That. that's very badass that's uh that's as badass as you need it right there <laughs> he's taking out the garbage with a garbage truck it's fucking fitting yeah it's 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 nothing but awesomeness right there so good for them <laughs> this is a high concept fucking movie and you're either down or you're not right and i am so fucking yeah. down with everything they're throwing my way so far yeah so far i'm uh, i'm pretty pleased about everything nothing wrong there so then we cut back to bg and uh eastland and they're all just they're having a good time and he's trying to convince them hey you should come work for me you know come work with me not for me but with me you know we can uh we can be pals we can be buddies and uh everything will be happy and uh, uh eastland's thinking about it he's like oh, he needs a job you know everyone needs a job nowadays so uh killing all the bad guys from the money's drawing up and killing all the bad guys i think um well he's probably running out of people too because he's just running around yeah. burning them alive before he even gets cash out of them true very true so it sounds like they go to then they go to a nightclub just to cut loose and party bg's hitting some chicks and eastland sees the young lady who he's been somewhat having time with She's dancing on stage. She sees him, and they, they you know, show up, and they kind of talk to one another all night. Uh, and they're all kind of hanging out. And then they're all going to go get BG as these two chicks, and they all want to go get food. And she's, you know, uh, uh, Eastland's lady's all about it. They get out. They see the dump truck. The two girls just kind of take off. But Eastland's lady, she's, she's like, fuck yeah, it seems like fun. So they get to, you know, having fun and hanging out. And BG's kind of like, I'm not going to be the third wheel in this party. So uh, he uh, he excuses himself and gives 
is Buddy the car, which I thought was nice. Or the the car, the truck. He leaves so, him with the truck after giving him a quick lesson on how to drive it earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're driving around, and all of a sudden, the gang sees the truck, and they recognize it from breaking up their party, uh, the the their heist. So they follow the truck, and you know they stop at her place, or I don't know. It might actually might be Eastland's place. I don't know. But they stop at the place, they're kind of on the top floor, they see him up there, and they're like, yeah, that's them, that's definitely them, so we gotta do something about this. Then, a cop pulls up, so, you know, actually does something right, and he actually starts writing a ticket to the to the trash truck, because it's illegally parked, of course. But, um, it does chase the gang members away, so then, Eastland, uh, the, he gets to, you know, uh, used to have a little fun, uh, and, uh... Yeah, they, uh, he and the lady get down, and, uh, you know, you see her boobs, so. Thank, thank you, movie. movie. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's possible. So they get down, and that's the end of that 20 minutes. Yeah, it's actually kind of this passionate, very loving, um, very. Yeah, you can tell he's, uh, hasn't probably felt human touch in a while like that, so. Good for him. Yeah. Good for you, Eastman. Right. Or Eastland. But it's it's this very uh, tender, loving kind of love making session where you're led you're led to believe that they are falling in love. In love. Yeah. Like this is very special, and you know, basically, what the movie is doing is giving Ginty something to send him over the edge even further, even though he's already round the bend, you know, and he's also falling in love. That he's tricking yeah. himself into maybe he can do both and have it all. Yeah. Something like that. Exactly. <laughs> and like BG's that's, coming that's exactly right. BG's coming in to give him like a replacement for his friend Jefferson that he lost because he's another yep. friend that he knew from the war. And so Ginty is trying to basically or Eastland I should say is trying to move on and you know f- just basically start a new life. Only this time he's decided he's going to settle down with this lady, you know. And th- this is sort of like what it's going to be. We know it's not going to turn out that way, but the film no, it's the film has to give things a- to him in order to take them away again that's these are also facts <laughs> and that's literally so. that's literally what this part of the movie's doing is like they're giving him things to take away from him to drive him into killing again and i believe that before all of the editing and you know adding action sequences and violence i believe that the idea was he came back to the city found his friend bg um started working with him and met caroline all within you know a very short amount of time but wasn't hunting down gangs and wasn't doing all this stuff i think what it was is it was bg's truck was supposed to be because he rammed through the stuff with X and his gang. So then they started following Robert Ginty and then she, uh, you know, and then what happens happens to the people that were given to him. The gang then takes him away. The whole flamethrower yeah. thing that we've seen before that's been added since then, I don't think, I think we were going to watch the parallel gangs versus, you know, what they're doing and how the, all these paths cross and intertwine and then come together or, you know, what's going to end up being the horrible thing that happens to both Caroline and BG to drive John Eastland into killing again. But the producers decided that wasn't enough. So why while all this is going on, he's spending his nights out with a flamethrower and a heat protective visor, <laughs> burning yeah, motherfuckers right. alive. Like there, there's there's a bunch of stuff where if you start to sit, if you just kind of like sit back and you think about what's going on, it's like a man who's happy and falling in love and, you know, made a new friend and is starting to like get his life back together is not going to continue to run around burning people alive. And, you know, we see him doing it like still while he's with these people at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of like the idea that it's BG trying to do the right thing and or just bust through that blockade and break out that truck you know because he can do it with the garbage truck i like that he's kind of the one that that gets himself into the trouble and gets you know eastland into it as well um because that's kind of almost how it happened at the at the beer distributor but it was actually eastland that went poking his nose where he shouldn't have um well actually no it's eastland went poking his nose into just wanting to stack the beer and he got taken out by a couple guys <laughs> right and then his friend came to save him so now it's his friend getting him into trouble for this one so it's just it's just interesting kind of like little twist on how they did the stories and stuff yeah. but i just i don't know like once you know that that flamethrower stuff is shoehorned in first of all you don't care because you're just happy to see that many people getting burned alive in a movie because it's horrific and really gruesome um but yeah but then after that you also like you know you can't not see how that was forced in later like you totally can't yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we start the next 20 minutes, and Eastland is, the next day, Eastland's watching the lady. She's dancing in, like, this outdoor theater, and she's practicing. She's got a big audition coming up. 
Well, then we get like this break dancing episode where she's like dancing with these guys who are kind of break dancing, and she has to use the restroom. She goes to use the restroom, but she's in there. Well, guess who followed them? The gang members are in there. Uh, they chase her out. She's running out of there. She, um, East, uh, Eastland hears her scream, so he starts running. A cop hears her scream, so he starts riding his horse over there. They're running. Well, one of the guys trips her with uh, a bat, and then they start beating the living shit out of her as she lays there. Eastland and the cop get there, but the, of course the gang have run off. Uh, cut to she is in the hospital. Uh, apparently she's never going to walk again. Um, it, it's kind of what it's alluding to. Uh, she's wheelchair bound. Uh, they bring her home, uh, Eastland and BG, and they bring her home and they try to, like, pump her up. They, they, they fixed up her place a lot, but she's kind of just staring into the full-length mirror she had in her apartment, like, for a dancer, and she's really not interested in anything. She just goes to bed. Well, those She's justifiably we- depressed. This dream of hers oh, has yeah. been taken away from her. Yeah, the dream of dancing. Exactly. Yeah, justifiably depressed, of course. Uh, well, BG and Eastland meet for a drink, and that's our final clip. What is it you want to talk about? I'm not really sure. Barton. Oh. What you drinking, John? Oh. Let me just have some scotch, huh? No ice. You got it. It just seems any time I ever get close to somebody, I get hurt. You're thinking too much, man. I'm thinking. And I've been all through this before. Just innocent people getting hurt. No matter what you think, no matter what you say, there's nothing you can do about what happened to Carol. Maybe. That's kind of meta. It's like self-aware at this point. Yep, pretty much. Um. Anyway, and he says maybe there's nothing. Maybe there's something I can do. Well, we see he's listening to police scanner again. Uh, uh, we had that members. police scanner, by the way, when I was a kid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think uh, my grandma had one like that, too. Um, well, you see, then two gang members are killing a guy uh, after they robbed him for pretty much nothing. The guy really didn't have much. And uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, Eastland, he lights them both up, killing them. Uh, we see the gang leader, he's working out, thinking in the elevator, th- doing push-ups. I think Mario, Mario Van People must have had like something to say about the scene. As those he's doing his push-ups while listening, you know, remembering people talking about the exterminator. Uh, they may be trying to pad out the movie from some of the things that they had to lose and or, you know, run time yeah. that they're missing for yeah, adding more flame only, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's only an hour and 20 at this point, so I guess I can see that. But also, if you've got um, someone like Mario Van Peebles who has that body and is willing to just like fucking do push-ups and pad out your runtime, why not use it? Pretty much. Uh, well, then we cut to, um, uh, the man in, uh, um, Eastland and his girlfriend, they're working on her rehab treatments, like trying to get her to move her feet and everything. She's able to move her toes, but not really her ankles. And as he's trying to encourage her, she has a full on papers clips moment and tells him to leave and to get out. Uh, BG shows up and he, then they both just leave because she's yelling at him. Uh, um, he also is pushing her a little too hard. He needs to let her come to terms is, with what's happening. But he's yeah. he's trying I mean, he to is, fix her. He's not trying to help he's her. He's a fixer. Yeah. He's, well, he's a fixer. He doesn't know what else to do. Well, he meets up with BG and they decide, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to do something about this. And they turn the trash truck into pretty much a ramming machine. Uh, they then, uh, grab some, uh, firearms and bullets that BG had stashed away in a junk pile. Um, so yeah, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna do some shit. And that's just how life is. Uh, get fucked if you don't like it. Wow. They come across some of the, uh, gang dudes, uh, and they, they, again, there's four of them. Uh, they knock two of them out. Uh, one of them, who's the same guy from the first movie, not the same one, but the same actor, the big dude. He runs away, uh, and then they interrogate a third. They actually, um, or the, they interrogate the fourth guy. They throw him in the back of the trash truck, and they start crushing all the trash into him. So he tells them where they're meeting for this deal that's going to go down for the drugs and the money. So uh, there you go. Uh, that's fun. And that's the end of that 20 minutes, and that's going to lead to the final 30. All right. So this is the point where I'm thinking like the reason that EG is so apt to help him is because it's kind of his fault, too, as to what happened to Caroline. That's what I'm thinking the original storyline might have been. But I also think BG, unlike his first friend who was paralyzed in the first movie, 
I think BG always was ready for this war on the streets. I think he always knew it was going to come to this, where his buddy may have been more apt to be uh, healthy after the war. I think uh, Eastland's buddy BG here is kind of like him. Yeah, he's a little bit looking for trouble, but at the same time, yeah. I, f- I mean, he's hiding all these weapons and bullets yeah. in a junk pile. He's like, I ah, this should be more than enough though, for what we need. And you're kind of like, damn, all right, homie. Well, he's Let's also go. picking up garbage all over the city. So I'm yeah. guessing that he is starting to see things that, um, you know, other people uh, maybe not a party to because most people just ignore garbage men, even gang members, you know. Yeah. So he's probably oh, yeah. been watching this coming down for a while because he was talking about it earlier and he's even talking when, when Eastland and him are first meeting up again and he starts, you know, kind of BSing with them a little bit. He has this sort of like conspiracy theory. The streets are being taken over by a gang, you know, by a leader known as X and there's X's everywhere and blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. he kind of gets into that a little bit, but without actually like going that deep. And I, mm-hmm. I feel like when he's showing him the guns, he should have been saying something like I've seen this coming down or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's just been like i don't i don't take any pleasure in this but i knew this day was going to come i just didn't think it was going to be me you know something along those lines some but no it just came across as he's pretty he's he's wanting to murder some of these game members as well so right it's like basically these guys are just looking for an excuse and like they met caroline and she just became their excuse that's basically what it's like and they put her in the fridge so they can go out and kill that's basically what's happening here kind of yeah no, I'm here. You're exactly right on that. All right, well, let's finish off that 30 minutes then. All right. Well, the gang and the mob, they're meeting. Uh, they exchange the money. They see they have the money. Mob pulls up the back of a hearse, and it's filled with drugs. Or a casket has all the drugs in it that's in the hearse. So they bring them the drugs, and, and everything appears to be going right. Well, BG and Eastlander, they, Eastlander he, they crash through the fucking uh, gates with the dump truck. Uh, as everyone kind of scatters, Skate Dude, uh, the uh, with the skates, he thinks he's going to go ahead and just uh, even uh, grab the money uh, uh, that they were going to give to the mob, even though the drugs are already been taken. And one mobster's like, nah, I don't fucking think so, Scooter, and shoots him dead. Uh, everyone sort of scat- uh, scatters, and... Um, uh, as they drive through, uh, we see the bag of drugs. And BG, for some reason, is like, we got to grab that bag of drugs. I think it's because he's like, it's going to end up on the streets if we don't. Yeah, so they he, needed to have some kind of dialogue in there. It just seems like yeah. he just wanted to get the drugs for them. Yeah, and I don't think so. I think the whole thing is he's he's going to get it so that it doesn't end up on the streets like it's supposed to. Right, but the film doesn't tell you that. You're just saying that to make yourself feel better about BG's obsession yeah. with getting a hold of them drugs. Yeah, well, that's. I'll tell myself whatever I fucking want to. You be in denial about what the film was and wasn't showing us all you want. It's fine. I'm, I'm gonna. Kids are mean to me. I'm gonna give you this one, <laughs> Slugger. Let's move on. Let's move on. Thanks, Dad. So, anyway, um, let's see here. Uh, well, anyway, he has the bag. He gets back up into the cab, but right before he can get inside, the leader of the gang blows BG fucking away, just machine guns him to hell. Uh, BG falls back into the cab, but pretty much he's dying. Tells Eastland, hey, I guess it is your truck now. Uh, <laughs> congrats. So he even BG tells a bad dies. joke as he's dying. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, love yeah. this character. I, know, I loved it. Yeah. Frankie Fiezen did a really great job in this. He really did. He always does a great job in everything he's in. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's always just like a little joy to have on screen. Like he just, yeah. he just brings you so much happiness because he's so like just upbeat and happy. Even as this guy who's like, you know, involved in like a yeah. fucking massive gun battle. So, um, uh, Eastland's getting out of there. Uh, and he sees behind him are those fucking mobsters, and, uh, he's like, fuck those guys, because they're following him in the, in that hearse, so he drops a fucking grenade back there, and it fucking, it blows them up, so it kills all the mobsters. Uh. And one presumes all the money. Yeah. Uh, he lays BG to rest and grabs, takes his dog tags off of him. Then he goes to call his lady, and we see she is very dead, naked on her bed with a red X on her back. So they found her, and they Lord, did Lord knows what. Well, if she well, was found naked and splayed out upside down yeah. on her bed, they clearly sexually assaulted her and then killed her. Uh, clearly. By the way, that was something that they added in when they wanted to make it more gritty and dark. Oh, there you go. Well, it did it. And they and... changed the ending of the film as well by having her be dead here. So they literally oh, really? fridged her to be able to put the ending on the film that it is now, because she was involved in the ending, and we'll get there when we get there. Okay. 
Um, so he rushes to her place and sees the red X on the door. And so, you know, he knows. And then we see her body again. Then we have a montage of him souping up the truck. Uh, this was fucking he, A-team level of souping up the truck. Yeah. And the guy in the back, well, he's able to crawl out and he runs away. And uh, Eastland watches him runs away. So you kind of think, well, Eastland wants him to do that. Uh, you know, if if the guy, if Eastland didn't want him to escape, he would be escaping, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's obvious he's letting him go because he even kind of chuckles as he unlocks it and walks yeah. away. You see him do it. Yeah, he's like, ha, look, at that. look at that guy going. Uh, look at him run. So, uh, so then th- that dude, he gets back to the base and he tells the leader everything. And the leader's like, well, you had to have told him about the deal. And he goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, they're going to crush me. And he goes, and I escaped. I want to tell you, I can tell you where he is. And he's doing some funky things with that truck. And he goes, see, I did good. Right. And he goes, yeah, you did great. And then he kills him. So this is the scene where he tells him that the guy who's burning people alive is also the guy with the truck. And it's, yeah, oh, yeah. And guy. he also says. He says this guy's the exterminator. I'm sorry, you're right. So he says, see, I did good. I'm telling you who the exterminator is. Right. And uh, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, he's basically like, he says something about, um, yeah, you did real good. And then he looks down at the guy who got shot during the drug deal that was botched and then takes his aggression right. out on this guy. Yeah. So sorry about your luck. Yeah, he um, fully murders him. He like snaps his neck or some shit like that. Yeah. Um, for betraying them and everything. But like the stuff with the plot line of him having his brother be burned alive, I think it's here. Like it's the guy who got shot who was the skates on the skates' mm-hmm. eyes. I think it's because eyes died that he killed this guy in the original version of the film. It had nothing to do with his little brother because he didn't have a brother who got burned. Because oh, huh. there was none of that burning people alive stuff that was in the film earlier. Yeah. Well, there you go. Just saying that one. Yeah, I'm. Just, this is speculation. I have no fucking clue. Um. So then they all the gang shows up to the garage, and uh, Eastland he's he's waiting for them. Uh, his it looks like the bag of drugs is like hanging from the ceiling, and then it explodes, and then like the truck, a whole bunch of like metal falls around the truck, so it shields him. Has tons of machine guns on it. He uses the machine guns to kill a bunch of motherfuckers. Um. This is an and, epic sequence of mass yeah. death. Kills tons of gang members. Uh, at one point, he dumps gasoline on a bunch of gang members and lights them up. And now it's time, pretty much, it's down to him and the leader. Um, it, it becomes heavy cat and mouse. However, the leader does get off a couple shots, shoots him in the leg. And also, Eastland is holding a bag. So the, the leader thinks that's the drugs. And they're going back and forth, a lot of cat and mouse. And then finally, the leader... Finds the bag alone, and he he's kind of yelling. He's like, "Hey, come on, John! You know you're you're fucked up just like me. Yeah, you know how I have to kill. I have to kill you, John." And he sees the bag, and he's like, "Huh?" And he opens it, and there's BG dogs tags. And as he pulls them out, the bag explodes, killing him. And we see uh, Eastland. He just limps away. Roll credits. All right, the ending as it was written, uh, Eastland is fighting with X. X gets the upper hand and is about to shoot Eastland or murder him or kill him, something like that. And somehow Caroline got there in her wheelchair and shoots X. And then Robert Ginty's character of John Eastland is able to then finish X off. Or as he's dying, he puts him in the garbage truck with the police on the way from all the shootout and stuff. And then he runs from the cops. And that's when we uh-huh. would roll credits, I suppose. But all right. because they wanted to add all of the flamethrower stuff, they added in the brother subplot, they added and all this other stuff they ended up doing a reshoot where caroline is laid naked and dead on the bed with the x spray painted on her back um yeah. you know just to kind of get her out of the way and then they do this like cat and mouse running thing that really pads out the runtime even though the movie's like an hour and 20 some odd minutes and it just mm-hmm. takes forever but i understand why they might have been like well how do they explain why caroline got there you know what i mean yeah but like they could have had something where maybe she was concerned about him and then you know went looking for him or whatever um Maybe they could have had the gang kidnap her and take her their wheelchair and all, you know, something. I, I don't know what the reason was why she would show up and all of a sudden be there to save him by shooting X. But I kind of like it better because the way that it was supposedly written is she may have shot X where she also was injured in her spine. Oh, nice. You know, and then that left him vulnerable to Robert Ginty's character of John Eastland, maybe. Or I think maybe she kills him. I can't remember 100%, but I know that he ends up dead. The body ends up in the garbage truck and Eastland goes on the run with the cops chasing after him to take the heat for her. Oh, there you go. 
So that makes sense then. Yeah, but yeah. they added all the extra action, all the stuff that you and I are looking for in a film, all the fucking flamethrower deaths and just like crazy, insane, gritty, fucking violent action. Um, That's all stuff that they added in, you know, later on whenever the film wasn't yeah. coming back with what they were expecting. Now, the garbage truck shootout stuff, they were always going to do that as far as I understood. But apparently well, they uh, added yeah, even sense. more. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, like even more violence and stuff like that. And again, like it got an X rating for all of the, the violence and gore and craziness. So they had to keep yeah. pairing it back until they got the hard R. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I can, I can see how there was probably a lot more gritty violence in this. And again, I watched this at five years old with my mom covering my eyes through the worst parts that she didn't want me to see. It's probably just the nudity. More or less, kind of, yeah. Um, some of the some of the violent stuff she still thought, like the people burning, if they were left burning for too long, like I'm pretty sure she covered my eyes when the helicopter pilot was burning alive because that was pretty awful. Yeah, that that was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, that was not enjoyable to watch. So I would just say, if you're a parent and you're watching this and you're wondering why the hell my mother let me watch it, but covered my eyes for certain things, then um, you know, just picture the things you would cover your kids' eyes for, and that's what my mom did because you know she's at least a good parent. As you, I promise. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, I came out without a criminal record from my hometown, so I did okay so far. No, no, I just never got caught. Well, anyway, we don't have enough time to talk about that right now, so we're gonna play the ending Legion promo, and then we're gonna close out this. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. Vitamins and history books Psychology and a different way to look at it all Cause my perspective is broken The suffering's a way to earn your keep I better start putting miles on my feet But I'm so tired of wandering Oh man, he's confessing a whole bunch of dark shit that uh, very much makes that a country song. Yeah, man, that's a good song. <laughs> Roger Bowling performing Friday Night Full. That was featured in the first Exterminator because unfortunately there's not a lot of music in the second Exterminator that I can actually use uh, no, for our purposes of the pirate radio edit. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> now, I know for sure that we have done at least one other double movie or a, just a two movie franchise in the past for our full franchise fest. And then even then I said it was a cheat. Do you remember what it was? Uh... No. Well, the audience can find it for us at legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. It's somewhere yeah. in the previous 324 episodes. Of course. All you have to do is Absolutely. look at every like even 150 toward and yeah. ends in a 25 or 75. I mean, you know? Court did the math for you early on, people. So, you know, you should know. Every 25th episode was a full franchise fest. Find them and then tell me which ones we did that were only two because I'm lazy. And there's that math again, motherfucker. <laughs> or don't just don't do it it's fine you can just go to our instagram and check out all the memes that i've stolen for you to share to our people it's cinema underscore yes. psyops on instagram all of our memes 
<laughs> yes, Matt can partake in the memes even though he has not contributed a one. But it's still our memes. Yeah, it belongs to the people once I repurpose them to them, yes. Word up, comrade. We're doing well. You can tweet a tweet to a singular twat who may tweet back at you. I am there as at court underscore psyop on the porn bot heaven known as Twitter. That's right. I'm not giving you mats anymore because he doesn't even fucking check it. Yeah, probably for the best. You can join our Facebook group and interact with me on Facebook at Cinema Psyops. It's aptly named for the show. Yes, I'm there. Court Psyops. I'm running that shit like this show in Barter Town. And Matt's yeah. there in a way that you can tag him to try and embarrass him, but he won't even look at it and it won't fucking matter. I also have no shame, so I don't know what you can do to embarrass me, but all right. <laughs> Point well taken. You can also email feedback to court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Let him know that Matt has no shame and there is no way to make him feel as though I have some sort of reference to actually protect. <laughs> yes, exactly. Whatever he just said. Well, while you're out there ruining your own reputation that you should be trying to protect, kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. Kicks. I've been looking for them all my life. Tricks. I'm playing everyone I meet. But somehow Hey, what's up? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yep, I hear you. All right, I don't hear myself very well, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> How's that sound? Perfect. Yeah, loud enough for you? Oh. Yeah. All right. And I am recording on my side. One, two, three. There we go. All right, so you're out next week with that same vacation all those girls are going on, right? Yep. Uh, are you going to try and record on the weekend to try and make up for that one, or do you just want to have the week off? I mean, either way is fine. I can find any podcaster that can fill your spot if you want. I just kind of want to know now so I know yeah, what to I'll, do for that. I'll take week. that week off, probably. All right. That's fair. That's totally fine. I mean, you know, I never get a week off, but, you know, that's just because. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jesus not, Christ. All right. Well then. <laughs> I'm not trying to I'm not trying to like make you feel guilty for leaving my poor planning of being short staffed uh as your somewhat boss in this venture that you also don't get paid for. You know, I'm not trying to guilt trip you and make you feel bad that you're leaving me in the lurch in any way, shape, or form, but you are. All right. I, I feel like yeah, you're definitely you're definitely being mean. <laughs> That's definitely mean. That's some mean shit you're doing right now. Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to leave all of this in, and what I'll do is I'll take out the part where it says what the trip is all about, and all I oh, said yeah, was that all I really said was that trip with some girls, so I can leave all of this in, and it'll be even more cryptic and weird. Yeah, it'll sound really weird. <laughs> you're on that trip with a bunch of girls. <laughs> but first, we're gonna go talk the exterminator and exterminator two. Fuck yeah, something I'm, I enjoyed more than I thought. Oh, but let's not ruin it. Yeah, yeah, let's just do the episode. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I don't know that something feels like the mafia had their fingers on this movie to me. Possibly. I got to grab some tissues, man. My sinuses are oh. coming. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. I'm back. All right. So. It's um, almost like we planned when we started bitching about past bad managers that we were going to be uh, bringing that up here, but we totally didn't. Right, we're not that we skilled. That's a, just a happy happenstance right there. <laughs> we're just um, lucky sons of bitches. Yeah, that's right. I finally got Maria to accept the money. I finally got Maria to accept the money. So she and Hang on. All right. I don't know what the hell happened there. Oh, the fucking tissue box fell and hit the mic or hit the uh, the button that happened to be the button I had assigned for that fucking clip so it played it twice. I got gotcha. you. He can justify it. The guy literally asked him to do it. Well, he blinked twice. Uh, he could have just had something in his eyes. Uh, that's that's a pretty important moment, man. I probably uh <laughs> I probably just keep my eyes open as long as I probably fucking could. Um, That's fair. God, you always have to look at the most fucked up way about it, don't you? <laughs> I can't help it. That's just how I'm wired, man. That's my brain. That's where my <laughs> mind went. I was like, what if he had something in his eyes? You're just, you're just all sorts of fucked up, ain't you? Okay. Made me lose my spot. 
I saw Exterminator 2 before I saw The Exterminator, and I saw it at an extremely young age. I was convinced that all cities were like this from a very, very young single-digit age because of this film. Wow. I wonder if I thought... I thought every I thought New York City was exactly like um, Jason Takes Manhattan, you know? <laughs> so Vancouver. Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or but yeah, I just thought that's what it was like everywhere. <laughs> just fucking, if you walk down the street by yourself, you're going to get murdered. <laughs> well, it was between this movie and Death Wish 3, I was convinced I never wanted to live in a city. <laughs> yeah, right? You, you wanted to stay as far away from cities as possible. Exactly. Uh, my, my dad had worked in a in, in a pretty large American city at the time when I was a kid, he would often invite, hey, you want to come up to the office with me? It's pretty cool because the, the office he was in was so high up. And I'd be like, why? So we can all get murdered? I'm like, I never I never know how dad made it home okay all the time. <laughs> he was a vet. He was going to take care of himself. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And so, uh, fucking Jesus Christ. Why do I have to fucking write like that? <laughs> fucking terrible. You should, you should start Which typing. Was, you really should. I, I really should. Almost just sad at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I didn't grab my show housekeeping, so this becomes a very entertaining outtake while I grab it. I hope you don't want ruining your own reputation that you should be trying to protect kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch Ugh, man, i'm fucking tongue-tied my sinuses are yeah. fucking killing me i'm fucking done all right i have stopped recording